So yeah, I'm just going to click on it. Yep. All right. Hello and welcome to another episode of Music, Philosophy and More. I'm your host, John Henry Sheridan. And tonight I have a treat for you. I have a fellow musician, a DIY artist uh, from Dayton, Ohio, named Mike Bankhead. Mike Bankhead, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, my pleasure. So uh, I always like to start off, well, not always, but most of the time start off uh, with how we met, how I might have met the guests I'm speaking to. And do you remember anything about the day we met? I, I have I have a rough memory of it. I remember it was really hot. <laughs> that entire uh, musician conference we went to was held in one of the warmest places you're going to find in this country in August. Yeah, yeah, that was a very hot uh, couple of days there in Austin. I remember that. Um, yeah, and we were in this, do you remember the name of that bar? It was a very cool bar. I do not. <laughs> I remember they had music, and I remember that when they also had a stand-up comedy night oh, as, yeah. part of their, as part of their regular routine. And I remember after the music bit for our conference was done one night, the stand-up comedians came in and the vibe mm -hmm. totally changed. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, I mean, that wasn't all, that wasn't the, the, all three nights of the conference that didn't happen. I, I forget which, which night of the weekend that was, but that was interesting. And I remember there was an outdoor stage in addition to an indoor stage. So they were doubling mm -hmm. up on, on artists, but I, yeah, for the life of me, I can't remember what it was called. Yeah. And I remember there was this like rock, rocky like cliff type of thing that was behind the outdoor stage yep it was really really cool vibe and and i you know i'm i'm a vegan which can be a little difficult when you're traveling and i figured probably in texas that might be a little extra yeah, hard they like beef down there yeah they do and as luck would have it whatever that bar was and in the show notes I'll, I'll find it and put it because um i have a video that i took from there but uh there was a, a vegan like what's the word um like comfort food restaurant right next door to it. I don't think it was like attached and it had yeah, burgers like, and, and I, chicken I, wings and whatever, but it was all vegan. It was all like faux from, beef, faux meats and stuff. From the hotel, I feel like you had, it was like uh, you had to pass it on the left right before getting to the venue, right? I'm trying to remember. Uh, it, it was like from the venue, there was actually a, um, an entrance from the, the inside of that venue. You could actually go through a fence and then there was this small little shack, which was a, uh, this food station, which was, it was all vegan comfort food. Uh, I was like, yay. I mean, they're not health food, but at least it was vegan and yeah. I could eat it and have a good time. Yeah. So anyway, th th that was fun. So that was 2019. And, uh, as Mike and I were just, um, uh, speaking about, um, it's a little bit sad as a result of the pandemic that we weren't able to meet, um, as uh, musicians in a conference setting with CD Baby since then. Yep. I also noticed the Iraq in the 2017 shirt, which uh, that conference was in Nashville. And uh, we were mm -hmm. both at that one, even though we didn't manage to meet each other at that one. Yep. Yeah. The, and I, I definitely would sport the 2019 shirt, but I don't, I didn't get one. Was there one? Do you have one? I do. I have no idea where, where mine is. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, I did get one. Oh, cool. Yeah. I definitely, this was, it just happened to be so comfortable that I, I just wear it a lot and, and, you know, and I, and I like CD baby. So, um, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I guess, uh, I'll just say what I remember from that day. Um, so there was this open mic night, I think it was the Sunday of the conference, the last night of the conference. And, uh, I think, yeah. And I was just roaming around kind of preparing, like what song could I play? And there's actually only one song I could think of to play which is a song called daddy that i wrote about my father it was the only one that i knew i would definitely remember the words to and uh that i felt like i wanted to share with people and it, it, i think it was like pick your name out of a hat to see if you get called and i think I, I was like the first one called or something like that and played the song a fellow musician took a video of it and uh just on a side note, I, I, we'll get to your interview. I know this is not about me tonight. <laughs> no, it's okay. This is part of the conversation. It's cool. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. So I remember after I played this song, I'm sitting in the, standing in the audience 
and the, the next performer is on. And I had this feeling and my father passed away 1987 when he was 36 years old. And I had this feeling that this, my father was standing next to me as a young man, because I was already older than him at that point. I was 38. So, uh, older than him when he died you know and uh i felt like his young energy like you know young man to me a little bit younger and he was like really just not just proud of me but he was really vibing like wow this is so great what you guys are doing young creators and musicians getting together supporting each other like you know it was just it wasn't like my dad it was more like this young guy in the audience who was my dad but you know and then i got home of course, this is just all my imagination or whatever, but I really felt it. I never felt anything like that before. And then I got home from uh, Austin and I think it was the next day, my friend uh, from high school sent me a uh, text message saying, hey, um, I really have this vision to do a, a video for your song, Daddy, like a full length video. I got a storyline and everything. It's going to involve your mother and all this stuff. And I'm like, I guess, because I actually posted a clip of from that live performance in Texas. I'm like, he must have saw it, it triggered something. And we started talking. He said, no, I had no idea you posted that. It was just this thing that happened to him at the same time when this, like, I was performing and I had this vision of my father. And then we made this video and it turned out to be really cool. So Awesome. Well, now I'm going to have to go watch it. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I'll put that in the show notes. And uh, And then I guess shortly after that, meeting my dad at the bar then i met mike bankhead a few minutes after that i think and learned about uh what you do and you told me you're a bass player and you told me you're uh into kind of like alternative rock i, I suppose that's, that's how you'd say explain it and uh i don't know I was, I was just i was just surprised for for whatever reason your demeanor i didn't expect that you would say that that you're a bass player who does alternative rock and uh, then I checked you out and I signed the mailing list and, and we've been in touch ever since. So yep. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm glad about that. That's the cool thing about the conference is you meet a lot of interesting people. And one of my personal rules when I get home from the CD Baby conference, I write everyone that I met from the conference. That's cool. That's very good. Because, you know, we, we go collecting business cards from our colleagues, right? So mm -hmm. you, I like to put those to use. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody writes back, mm -hmm. and it doesn't necessarily mean that we establish a relationship with everyone, but at least make the effort, right, mm -hmm. to acknowledge, hey, we both had this experience together, and maybe we talked for 10 minutes over a three-day weekend, or for, for the occasional musician that we might have gone to all the same seminars, maybe we talked every day for 10 minutes <laughs> for mm -hmm. a three-day weekend, right? Mm -hmm. um, but even if it's someone I only ran into for a couple of minutes and we connected enough to exchange cards, I always try to write everybody at least once. Um, yeah, but we had a good enough conversation and uh, a good enough connection uh, that, again, you dropped on my, jumped on my mailing list. Don't think I didn't notice that. My mailing list isn't huge enough, but I haven't figured out everybody that's on it, um, <laughs> for which I thank you. And yeah so we kind of kept in touch which could lead to musical collaboration in the future i've uh i've been co-writing recently and i kind of like it uh, and i'm uh, trying to reach out and co-write with more people from different genres and different disciplines so don't be surprised if i hit you up for that one of these days mm -hmm. cool yeah and, and I, I i kudos to you for doing that uh with um with reaching out i i guess that's kind of probably why we connected because i have a similar ethic and i think i would make, I had the, the business cards, anyone that I felt a vibe, a good vibe with, or like had, you know, sometimes you exchange business cards, it's very stale, you're like, there's just no point. But if you had good energy from somebody, I would say, let me write them a note. Yeah, just kind of like as a, let me make, get my money's worth from this conference type of thing. Who knows what it would lead to, but, you know, and I noticed that that about you, you, re you reached out to everyone in an email saying, hey, if I met you at the conference, just saying hi. And uh, yeah, and I was doing similar thing and, um and yeah the music you were doing seemed to me to be like music i would dig too so that, that's a bonus so uh, i'm going to jump into uh, my first question for you mike you ready i am ready mentally and emotionally preparing myself <laughs> all right it was gonna be a nice smooth ride so can you remember what it was that got you into enjoying music in the first place and what were some of your primary inspirations my parents 
I cannot remember a time when there wasn't music playing in my home uh, as a toddler. Hmm. In fact, and I probably might have only, I don't know that this next bit I've said in an interview, I feel like I might have written it in a written interview. The earliest song I can remember hearing is Bay by Styx. Bay. And if you go hmm. look at the when that record came out, it was late 70s, so I would have been one or two when that came out and then one of my parents had it and had it playing on the turntable now i don't remember learning the name of the song or who wrote it until i was grown <laughs> right mm -hmm. like i remember hearing i distinctly remember hearing that song but i was an adult before i knew that song was called babe and it was by a band called sticks um, but my parents oh. always had music in the house they uh not necessarily the exact same kind of genre my mom and my dad had different musical tastes uh, so I was exposed to each of their tastes, and eventually I developed my own taste in music, which, because teenagers tend to be somewhat rebellious, uh, was completely different than what my parents listened to until I became a musician and then realized that, no, it really wasn't that different. If you <laughs> Once you learn how to play, you, you, you hear music in a different way, right? So uh, sure. I gravitated to that early 90s rock and roll stuff, which... If you look under the hood enough, there's influences from the 80s and the 70s rock and roll. And if you go back far enough, there's influences from soul and uh, the original R&B from the 40s and 50s, right? So that those musical influence kind of seep through <laughs> music uh, to this day. It's just that as a teenager, I didn't know that. Um, mm -hmm, right. <laughs> yeah. Now, I've mm. already forgot the second half of that question. Well, yeah, you get into it. So what are some of your primary inspirations? So you're saying early 90s rock, maybe some bands or some artists that really stuck out to you? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I listened to pop radio as a teenager around the time. So if you look at 90, 91, 92, uh, Top 40 was dominated by uh, gangster rap, strangely enough. And <laughs> what, what they would call grunge or alternative then, which, you know, the older I get, it's just rock and roll, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, like, on the, the pop station here in Dayton, they would have a countdown every weekend on the most popular songs requested or whatever. And there was always, like, a Snoop Dogg song at the top of the chart, but also always either a Pearl Jam or Nirvana song in the chart. Mm -hmm. and those could not be, you know, those are two completely different genres of music, but at the time they were competing for top 40 listening, which yeah. really is kind of hard to wrap my brain around the way music is fragmented these days, right? Yeah. <laughs> like neither of those things would be top 40 today. Um, mm -hmm. True. But when I actually started buying music with my own money, uh, it was rock and roll. So uh, I can remember some of the first albums I bought on cassette with my own money uh, were the Nirvana Nevermind record. Uh, Jen Blossom's Invisible Experience, R.E.M.'s Monster Record, which was my first exposure to R.E.M., mm. which is weird because most R.E.M. fans at the time didn't like that one. Mm -hmm. um, but that was what got me into the band, and then I went back and listened to their older stuff, right? Um, I is, had, that, is that the one that had Orange Crush on it, uh, Monster? No, Orange Crush is on Green. Uh, green Monster okay. had West of Frequency, Kenneth. Someone's going to correct me, but I think Orange Crush is on green. Um, Monster had What's the Frequency, Kenneth, followed by Crush with Eyeliner. So there's a song with Crush in it. It's not the mm -hmm. one. Uh, Star 69 is on that one. Um, Tongue is on that one. Circus Envy. I'm getting the songs out of order, but I'm getting at least all the titles right. Uh, <laughs> Bang and Blame is on that. Uh, Strange Currencies is on that. Um, fantastic record. Like, I love it. But. Uh, yeah. hmm. I, I think it's. I think it still holds up. Uh, I had uh, Counting Crows, August, and everything after uh, on cassette. Mm -hmm. I had Soundgarden, Super Unknown on cassette. So that's you know a lot of the rock and roll that managed to get over to the mainstream um, was mm -hmm. the stuff I liked. And there's good songs in all those albums. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I'm a sucker for a good song, I guess. <laughs> did you have? Uh, did you go? Get the back catalog of Soundgarden too, Bad Motor Finger and Loud and I Love, listen, any of that stuff. That's a good question. I listened to it all. I did not. I did not actually buy any of the previous albums, but I have. I have heard it all. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I did buy because uh, Nevermind is actually Nirvana's second record, right? I did actually buy 
their first album on compact disc. Oh, yeah, point. Bleach. Mm-hmm. Yep, at some point, but I don't remember. It was a few years later. Um, and I think my favorite song on that one is, is one that they didn't even write. It's uh, Love Buzz because Chris Novoselic does very nice work on the bass line on that one. Mm-hmm. Who wrote that? Do you remember? I do not. I could Google it real quick. <laughs> sure, I'm curious. Yeah. yeah, and I know that album very well, Bleach. I got that when I was probably 12 or something and possibly 11. And I just remember like, because I was just getting into guitar and I'm like, I didn't really like that style so much, but like, I could do this. You know, it just like gave me this confidence. Like, wow, I could kind of, I, I can understand almost what they're doing. Yeah. You that's know, that, that's that punk influence, right? Really simple uh, for rhythm guitars. Uh, Internet tells me that Love Buzz was written by Robbie Van Leeuwen, who is Dutch, and his band was called Shocking Blue. Oh, wow. Shocking Blue. I wouldn't have known that. Me neither. Like, I completely, I just, all I knew is that Nirvana didn't write it, but I had completely forgotten who did. Now, <laughs> cool. Uh, yeah, Nirvana. So what about Pearl Jam? You were into Pearl Jam too? Yeah, I love 10. Used to go to sleep to that one. Uh, <laughs> the last track on 10 release is that kind of soaring, yeah. um, soaring, emotional. Kind of dreamy. Ballad. Yeah, kind of dreamy. Maybe it builds, but yeah. I, um, great, way mm-hmm. to end a, great way to end a cassette release is. Yeah, I, I, agree. I agree. I think 10 was basically a masterpiece, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. Those songs all still hold up too. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. they sound of their time, but they're well written, which means they don't sound old to me. If that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you could maybe hear the recording techniques were a little bit yep. different, or whatever. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's a good. I listened to the whole album recently. It's the only Pearl Jam album I could listen to front to the back. Uh, really? Yeah. I see. Now I want to get on a list of Fen Pearl Jam tangent, but I won't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I would. I would recommend revisiting yield and their self-titled one with the avocado on the front because those are two that i listen to back to front a lot really Uh, yeah Uh, after after 10 those are my favorite two pearl jam records and i know people like what about versus that album was great and went a gazillion times platinum yes it did and yes it is but uh i really really do like yield and the uh self-titled avocado cover pearl jam record Okay. Yeah, I think I maybe it was just the timing when I got into it. I was just not prepared to listen to a full album. And, I, you know, of course, I didn't get the cassette or didn't get the CD or have the time. And uh, so I, I, I think I gave it a one listen through maybe one time. And I did like it. But uh, one of those, I don't remember which one, but one of the newer ones. And uh, yeah, I'll revisit it. I, I appreciate that. It's their catalog. I mean, it's big. You think about, I mean, they've been a band for what, 25, 30 years now. Um, mm-hmm. They haven't stopped making records. I think they put one out in 2020, actually, right before the pandemic happened. Um, mm-hmm. which I listened to like twice or three times and they didn't get a chance to go on tour to support it the way they, they would normally. Um, but that's a band that keeps creating. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Kudos sure. to them. I mean, at this point, they, they don't have to worry about being able to, being able to afford <laughs> to keep creating right they mm-hmm. uh, they're financially set but um they haven't got bored making music and i like to see that yeah which is interesting i i wonder how bands could because it seemed you would think that pearl jam would probably have a choice to just not continue like maybe they aren't so contractually bound like some other bands maybe yeah, they I, are i, I know, think but... they've satisfied they were but i think they mm-hmm. satisfied uh their contractual obligations um years and years ago and i'm pretty sure these days they're they release everything on their own terms mm-hmm. yeah good for them yeah um and uh so i got the sense that, that that you were definitely into grunge were there any like sort of i think you, i saw smashing pumpkins in, in yeah. your bio uh every smashing pumpkins record actually i like all of their records um until I shouldn't say until I like all the records. The first four I like the best, but even like the stuff they were putting out. Um, I'm gonna forget the name of the album. Oceania, I think, mm-hmm. uh, I which that. Nicole Fiorentino played the bass on. Um, I like that album too. I just haven't listened to it as much as the older stuff. Right, uh, the the stuff that came out when I was in my teens. Mm-hmm. I listened to those albums hundreds and hundreds of times. <laughs> so they sink in 
in a way that's different from an album line I've listened to 11 times, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, Oceania, I I've listened to it a bit. You know, again, it came out a little more recently, so I wasn't in the mind space for it, but there's one song in there that I just listened to so much. Uh, the drumming is awesome. I know the drummer was, was not Jimmy Chamberlain on that album, I believe. It was uh, Google that too. another guy. And what was the name of the song? I think song? you're right, because Jimmy was there, and then he left, and then he came back, and then he left again, and I think he's back with him now. Yeah, right, right. But uh, yeah, this song, let me see if I could find it. Uh, um, if I get the name of the Mike Burns, the, track the drums list. on that album. You are correct, sir. Okay. That guy's good, man. I, I got the feeling he was kind of younger. I don't know if it's true yeah, or I mean, it was hearsay. Younger than Jimmy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this one song I, I highly recommend. Uh, Oceania Pumpkin. I'm just trying to. Oh, okay. Yeah, which, which song was it? Um, Violet Rays, I think it is. Yeah, if you give that a good listen, I, I jog to it so many times. The drumming is just so fun to follow. Now, I'm, I'm not a drummer, but I can play drums fairly well. And just listen, following what he does is just so fun on that song, Violet Rays. And it, it's really like well composed. There's, there's a lot of sort of sounds, you know, they do, they do like that, like uh, wall of sound type of thing. Yep. It, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of like that. Um, yeah, I don't know. If you haven't heard that one recently, uh, I'll go not recently. Sort of See, that gives me something to focus on on my next re-listen. So thanks for that. Sure. Yeah. Um, any other bands you want to throw out there before the next question? Uh, no, because they'll probably come up anyway as we get through all the other questions. Yeah. Let's just say that I have a lot of influences. <laughs> yeah. Um, how would you describe the overall influence? that music has had on your life up until today? So I think that comes in pieces. There's a time when you're young where music is the most important thing ever. Mm -hmm. uh, that time as a youth when you have difficulty expressing your emotions, the adults in your life, you feel like they're not listening to you. Whether they do or not, you feel like they're not. Uh, you feel like nobody understands you. Maybe nobody does, maybe somebody does, but that's what, you know, when you're, when you're that youthful age, everything's so intense. And when you latch on to a certain kind of music, it ends up speaking to you and music becomes the most important thing. Um, looking back on that, that's the mark of a good songwriter, right? Uh, we we want to be able to touch people and have an influence on hopefully positive in, in their life or hopefully if we write about things that are not positive, people can take away that, oh, I'm not alone. There are other people dealing with this, right? Um, so mm -hmm. that's the mature old guy in me speaking <laughs> that I, the songwriters who wrote those songs had, had the desired impact on young me. But I didn't do anything without having music around. And the listening environment, for want of a better term to describe it, was completely different back then. Streaming yeah. was not a thing. That's for sure. So when I was doing my homework or watching TV or reading, I'd play cassettes or CDs as the technology changed and I would play them front to back. Mm -hmm. Even if I was, even if I wasn't doing anything else, I, I had, there was time I set aside. This is my music listening time. Mm -hmm. And I listened to albums front to back. I didn't skip around <laughs> front to back, straight, straight through read all the lyrics, read all the liner notes, thought about the lyrics, <laughs> listened to the music enough, and this is before I could even play, but listened to the music enough to pick out what each instrument was doing. And people today, other than musicians who are obsessed as we are, just don't listen to music that way. How many mm. people in the generation behind us will sit down and listen to a record front to back? regardless of, the, like, let's say it's on streaming, right? I mean, they don't necessarily have to do it in the hard copy form, but how many people just listen to an album, every track in order, no skips, as intended? Right. They don't. It's just not how people consume music these days. But that's how I consumed all of the m music that I spent my hard-earned money on. Mm -hmm. um, 
And that's another difference. Like if I bought a CD because I heard one song from it, usually you only heard one song from it before you bought it. Maybe I didn't like that album the first time I listened to it, but I just spent $15 on it. So <laughs> I would listen to it 50 times because I bought it. And sometimes it would grow on me. Yeah. And sometimes I'd end up really, really liking that album. I mm -hmm. think there's I think there is music that doesn't necessarily affect me in a positive way right away. It doesn't just jump out of the speakers at me. And there is some music that might require some extra time and effort to get into. I feel that way about classical music, by the way. Like I feel like when I listen to classical music, if I I if in order to enjoy it, I need to be sitting down and committed to listening to classical music. Uh, my wife is different than this. She'll put it on in the car. And I'm like, the car is not the place for classical music to me. Like, if I'm going to listen to a piece of classical music, I want to be in, I'm not doing anything else. It's in my headphones, mm -hmm. concentrating on a note. Um, uh. But that's how I would consume everything uh, back then. And it helped me to, to, I know it was cathartic just to sing out loud in your room or wherever and get those emotions out. Uh, so now... So fast forward, where now that I've learned how to play, I still listen. There is still music I listen to that I don't write that affects me that way, which I guess is good, right? It makes me feel like I, I haven't changed completely. But now that I write, I find that music is a way for me to kind of deal with, still a way to deal with feelings and emotions and process things. And the nice thing about that is it doesn't necessarily have to be shared. Right, mm -hmm. I, I have perfectionist tendencies, and if I write something because I need to write it for me, but I think it's garbage, you're mm -hmm. never going to hear it, <laughs> mm -hmm. which is fine, right? It That's needed to right. get written. It gets written. Nobody has to hear it. Uh, the only things that people end up hearing are things that I'm like, well, this might have some universal appeal, or I think I just made a quality piece of art. Uh, but first, I write for me because it it keeps me a little closer to sane than I otherwise would be. And I, mm -hmm. I have to, I'm, I'm at the point where I have to write. I have to make music for my own personal emotional sanity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can relate. And, and I get that vibe from you because of your consistency. You know, I, I've been being on your mailing list for a couple of years now. You just, you will send an email. I, I, just, I can't put on the clock, but it'll come. Oh, there's Mike again. Mike Banchetti's but now another song or we just did an interview with someone or something like that. And that consistency shows me that you must be compelled in some way, you know, because it's easy. It's very easy to just not do it because of it can feel thankless at times being an artist, just putting it into the, the masses, you know, the, the saturated, you know, platforms. Mm -hmm. But uh, if, if we're like, like myself, like you, if we're compelled that we just kind of, can't not do it right can't not <laughs> like that no that is exactly what it is can't i can't not do it um and i mean i do again i do have a filter not everything i write gets not everything i write is good enough to share and even the things i write that are good enough to share not all of them manage to make it to the studio to get professionally recorded mm -hmm. sure but, but i have to mm -hmm. Yeah, hey, I, 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 you know, put a kind of vulgar way, I, I regarded my creativity, my creative flow as, as, you know, as kind of like pooping, you know, if I don't do it, it gets backed up and that's just not good. And it's more important to get it out than to be constipated, you know, uh, creatively. That's not so much vulgar, but medically accurate, I think. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. For creative people, I think that's kind of how we function. So I've, I've never been this, I, I'm a, I'm a prolific artist in the sense that just I just write a lot. I can't help it. And uh, I'm not saying it's great or anything, but uh, sometimes there's a gem. But a lot of times it's just it's just whatever raw materials that get a little bit polished in the process and then come out. And I don't really care about creating something really, really great most of the time. This is, this is the way I work because it's just too much of it. So for me, it's much more important to get a lot of stuff out, kind of like a Pete Seeger or a Bob Dylan, like, you know, once in a while, Bob Dylan writes a great song, but a lot, he just writes a lot, you know, and there are artists like that. And I feel like I'm a little bit like that. And or I just, like, uh, I say like Dayton's own Bob Pollard from Guided by Voices. Oh, yeah. That dude has 
hun- he's made hundreds and hundreds of released albums, and he's got <laughs> thousands and thousands and thousands of released songs. Um, the Guided by Voices released three albums last year during a pandemic. They're getting wow. ready to release their second one this year. They just and Bob Pollard has always been like that. Mm-hmm. The thing that's crazy to me is one, he's a complete genius, but two, he's got no like. I'll write a song and I'm like, that's not good enough, but no one ever hears it. Bob will write a song and just throws them all on the record, whether they're good or not. So sometimes, <laughs> and this is just my opinion, there are people that love this band very much who like everything he puts out. But sometimes I will pick up a Got It By Voices record and I might have 20 songs on it and three of them might be the best songs you've ever heard in your life and five of them <laughs> are just kind of good. And like, but they're like, half of them might be like, eh, I don't dig this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, Bob, you could write you could take those three songs that are the best anyone's ever heard from three consecutive albums and condense that into one album and just, but like, he just puts it all out. Which <laughs> is a bravery that I do not have. Mm-hmm. But I also don't write songs that are undeniably great as often as he does either. And so maybe that's part of it. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, and I think from his perspective, perhaps, I don't know that band at all, but, or him, but from my own, if it's similar to my own perspective, there, I don't get to the gem unless I, I do the, you know, the several rocks before it, you know, well, so that's putting in the work, right? I mean, yeah, you, you have to write a certain amount of bad ones before you get to the good ones. And I think that's probably true for all songwriters. Mm-hmm. It's like to make another medical uh, metaphor, it's like a muscle, right? The more you use it, the stronger it gets. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I also tend to think that songs are, uh, that I'm not a good judge of what's a good song, by the way, like of my own material. Because a lot of songs, a lot of times the songs that people like are not my favorites of my own. So they're not the ones that I would put forward. So I just put them out thinking, oh, yeah, of course I test around like guest friends, what do you prefer? But, and then eventually I just have to go with my own gut. And uh, yeah, sometimes the ones that I listen to a lot, I just have to laugh. Like I was going to not put, I wasn't going to put that on the, you know, you hear like uh Pour Some Sugar on Me by Def Leppard was almost a throwaway. And that's one of their biggest, you know, their biggest hits. So, yeah. or even Brown Eyed Girl from Ben Morrison. I think he says he hates that song or something, or he doesn't really like it. I think Dan Wilson, um, he's the songwriter from Semisonic, has said, among other projects, has said the same thing about Clothing Time, which was Semisonic's biggest hit. It was like when he first released it, he thought the lyrics were not like he's like, it wasn't one of the strongest songs on the album but that was the one that people liked. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah, and I, I kind of feel like each song is, is my own child in a way, right? So if I can, like, send it on, have it, give it a life of its own, I try to. But of course, some are not meant to leave the nest, that, you know, like you're saying. Uh, there are plenty of songs that, of mine that people not hear. If I do my best to get as many, whatever, as many of them out as I can, that, that's my choice. It's not... This, what CD Baby uh, officials would recommend, right? Like to just <laughs> no. splurge it all out, you know, or most anyone with like a business sense would recommend, but I'm an artist before a business person. So I just, I just do it. But um, anyway, yeah, it's a lot of fun to talk. I just want to say hello to anyone watching. Thank you very much for joining us on the show. If you have any questions for myself or Mike, uh, please leave them there or comments um, and feel free to hit that uh, like or love button and share it. And if you're watching the replay, please do so too. Hey, Darlene Carney, thanks for watching. And uh, we also had a friend, Yuri Andrade Oliveira, checking out from Brazil. I'm not sure if he's still watching, but... Bom dia. Obrigado. Boa, yeah. boa tarde. Obrigado. Boa tarde. Obrigado, amigo. Nice. So you, you know your uh, Portuguese there? I just know a couple of words. <laughs> Sweet. Have you had experience in Brazil? No, no. Um... I, but I have run into Brazilians here in Ohio, and uh, I do speak French and Spanish, and Portuguese is in the same language family. Mm-hmm. Right, right. So I can kind of read it. Yeah. But, but the this I do have a really hard time understanding it spoken. Uh, and yeah, I'm the, I'm backwards, so I can uh, speak and and read uh, Portuguese fairly well. I because I lived there for about a half year, but Spanish I can read. Like when it's spoken, it's just a little too much for me. You know, I'd love to speak it one day. A lot of opportunity to practice living in the city. Yeah, true. There's certainly a lot of Spanish speakers here for sure. 
Um, but my wife is Japanese, so I have my mind on that. I, I, I speak Japanese and so I'm working on that. And well, that's awesome. Yeah, it's cool. And, and my son is kind of getting there. I mean, he definitely speaks more fluent than I do. You know, he doesn't know as many words or whatever, but, and his kanji, I'm not familiar with kanji in it's Japanese. The writing, but, right? Yeah, it's, it's the complex writing system, um, with the pictographs in it. He's, he's getting there. So he's going to, like, I, I studied a lot. I lived in Japan for two years. I really put in the homework as best as I could as an adult. But I could tell in two or three years, he's going to know a lot more than me. And uh, which is great. That's what I want. But it is. Uh, Honestly, I know we're off on a tangent here, but I think it's a gift to be able to, if you can speak a language other than the one that you were born speaking, if you have the, the ability and time to learn, um, it opens up doors for you, not just in business, but also like in life. And I tell people, look, there's awesome people everywhere. And a lot of them don't speak English. Yeah. So if you only speak English, there's a lot of awesome people that you're never going to have a chance to communicate with, even if you were to meet them. But if you learn one or two other languages, then that expands the group of awesome people you'll be able to talk to. Yeah, very well said, man. I remember I was in Brazil doing this volunteer work. So I was living there for five years. I came back later for a month. So all in all, about six months in Brazil in my life. Anyway, about the end of the second month in or something, I've been practicing a lot because very few people speak English there. And uh, I'm walking down in the small town I'm in with, it, with this native guy who's been hanging out with us, support, you know, showing us around, younger kid. And I'm starting to feel like he's my buddy, like, that I grew up with. I mean, that kind of like kinship and we're talking, we're joking around laughing and all it just dawns me like, holy snap, this, this guy knows no English. So I guess I'm speaking Portuguese, you know? Yeah. yeah Cause like, I got what he was saying. He understood me. We're laughing. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I know he doesn't speak English. So I guess I'm, I'm doing it. You know, <laughs> that's a cool moment. The moment when your learned language no longer feels foreign to you. Um, I, I express it that way because we, you know, as when we learn languages, we never lose our original accent unless we're just complete sonic geniuses, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're always going to speak American accented Portuguese. I'm always going to speak an American accented Spanish and French, um, regardless of how fluent I get. You just don't lose every trace of your accent. But there comes a time, even though it's not your first language, when it no longer looks or feels foreign. Mm -hmm. it is like you look at it written on a newspaper or you hear it on tv and it's just like oh that's just another language i know um yeah <laughs> realizing that is is a pretty cool thing um i have a lot of personal stories about realizing that but one of my favorites to tell people is i was in china once uh for my corporate job which i still have uh and i was out doing some touristy things and i don't speak a word of chinese um and so i'm i'm touring this uh, complex of buildings that was the royal family's inhabitants or something. And I hear nearby somebody speaking French. And it's a tour guide, a Chinese tour guide, who is speaking perfect accent-free French. And that I was surprised at um, to a tour group. And let me just tell you, when you're in a country where nobody speaks your language <laughs> for like a week, and then all of a sudden you hear something you understand, even if it's not your native language, because French is not my native language. But just hearing words that I understood like, <laughs> grabbed me right away. And I followed this tour group around the complex like I was a thirsty kid looking for a <laughs> glass of water just to hear something that I understood and could follow. And also I enjoyed uh, learning more about the residents. Um, and then when I was done, I kind of reflected, wow, uh, yeah. French is not my first language, but it's no longer foreign to me. Like, yeah. say, Chinese was. Mm -hmm. that, that's great. That's a great story. And I could definitely imagine that happening. Uh, I could imagine that, picture that scenario. Um, so uh, got a couple more comments here. Linda Sheridan, uh, also, known as, also known as mom, uh, Hi, mom, said, can you think in that language? I'm not sure what the C means. I guess she was saying, because my, my mother's fluent in Norwegian. So uh, that's great. And I guess she's, she maybe she's asking, are you able to think in uh, Spanish or, or French? Yes. And yes, I actually even write songs in those languages. If mm -hmm. that's what the song needs. Um, there's, right, a song in, there's a song in Spanish in my first album. Uh, there's a song in French on 
uh, split album I released with the actually there's a song in front of my first album too but there's a better song in front on the split album I released um, in 2019 and I released a single in Spanish back in the spring so um, I try to do what the song calls for and if it's something that needs to be expressed in not English I express it in not English um, so for mom Linda I actually do better thinking in the other language if I'm in country mm -hmm. I mean I can do it here but it becomes better if I'm surrounded by it and I don't hear English every day. Um, yeah, the immersion yeah. feeling. Yeah, um, absolutely. When when I travel to France, like my accent and my rhythm speaking improves dramatically by like the third day in country. And mm -hmm. like my friends over there will say that. Like it'll be a week into this day and they'll be like, you sound a lot better than you did the day you landed. I'm like, well, because I've been around you people all week. <laughs> That's listening, awesome. Listening to the way it's supposed to be spoken. So yeah, I I um I I can think in in all, in both of my secondary languages. I dream in my secondary languages. If wow. if a character in the dream is someone I know from real life, and that someone is a French speaker, they don't speak to me in English in the mm -hmm. subconscious, right? They speak to me in the language they speak. Um, right. And, and you said you were in Brazil for five years. No, no, five months. Five months. Yeah. That's enough to be able to think in Brazilian Portuguese. Yeah, yeah, because it was the water I was swimming in, and there was really a lack of, there's one guy who spoke English, really. So, I mean, I could, my teammates spoke English, but uh, but to communicate with the locals, we just really had to dive in. So it got to the point, you know, I was always, I was doing some translating. I was always just trying to, like, think how I'm going to say things. And there's that a bit of translation in your head type of thing, but it became to the point where, Give me a week in Brazil, probably even three or four days, and and it's it's coming out smoothly. I can't understand it so well, you know, right away, but it comes out of me pretty smoothly. There's just a part in your brain that takes over, and yeah, it's great. So uh, our friend Deanna Giordano says hi, hi Deanna, thanks for hanging out with us. Um, yeah, Deanna has uh, this cool event coming up uh, regarding her mother's a scholarship in her mother's name. And uh, she's looking for artists, FYI, um, to perform. Anyway, uh, Deanna Giordino, Giordano, sorry. So, uh, oh yeah, and just one uh, memory. Um, when I went to Japan one time, went back, because I lived there for two, 2011, 2012, basically. I went back, maybe the first time was 2015. And I remember laying down on a tatami mat room at her, my wife's family's house and Oh, uh, just kind of like the day we arrived, we arrived in the morning, which is very disorienting. Uh, we, you went to China, right? So like the time difference is so. It messes you up. Yeah, it really messes you up. So I remember just laying in bed and all of a sudden like um, just being flooded with just, just how to say things in, in Japanese. I couldn't, I couldn't like think in English for, for a while. It was just like all these ways of expressing came in. Like the country just dove into it. it was really amazing and it came back and i was just speaking japanese again uh it was great so you're right there's so many people that you wouldn't make, meet awesome people if you're not willing to stretch you know to meet them halfway you know yep by learning another language uh so let's see uh so what mike inspired you to pursue music seriously as an artist in the public eye I never thought my songs were good enough for that. And then I'm going to say very nice things about a gentleman from my community. Uh, an engineer slash producer uh, from Dayton uh, by the name of Patrick Himes, who I've known for 20 some years. Uh, he had run off to Nashville to work in the industry, as you do. Mm -hmm. And a few years ago, he came home, came home to Dayton. Uh, there were some family issues that he needed to take care of, uh, I believe. But also, I don't think he liked charging as much as he had to charge people to survive in Nashville, right? It's, the, it's an industry city, and it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a tough place to survive as a musician, even if you're good. And he's yeah. great. Um, so he came home, 
and I remember talking to him uh, at a show. And as soon as he came home, he started playing shows and jumping into bands and re reopened his studio here. And I knew that uh, he was an engineer because he had made some some records from local bands that I that I had liked. And I remember talking to him that uh, that I'd been writing, and he said, "Oh, why don't you send me some of your songs?" And I did, and he said that they were good, and said, "Why, you know, you should think about making a record." And I don't think I would have even bothered to make that first record had he not come home, mm -hmm. um, just from being self-conscious about is my art good enough? Does it stand up to the other artists that uh, that I like to listen to? Uh, as musicians and as artists, I think we're always our own worst critic first. Yeah, and it's hard to turn that part off. But there were certain songs I thought, man, this has potential. I would try to imagine it, you know, since I'm just writing either with the bass or with the piano. Imagine what the full arrangement would sound like if I had a whole band. Is this something that 15 year old me would like to buy? Mm -hmm. Imagine I hear this on the radio. Would 15 or 16 year old me dig this? And the answer started to be yes. And I trusted Patrick because this was somebody that I'd known for a long time. And I made that first album. And then I thought to myself, well, I'm going to, I'm going to make this album and I'm going to try to sell them. That's, that's a business transaction right there. Mm -hmm. As someone who is really interested in doing things the best way possible, by which I mean, I'm going to use a corporate term, but best practices, find out the, the best things to do that have worked for as many people as possible. And if you can adapt and do those things, do those things. And I wanted to be all legal and on the up and up. And then I learned that, uh, you know, if you're a musician, any music related expense, you can deduct from your taxes to lower your tax burden to the United States government. It's totally mm -hmm. legit. Now you have to be able to prove to the IRS if they come asking that you're taking this seriously as a business or they don't take too kindly to people doing fraudulent things mm -hmm. on, on their taxes. Then I thought, you know, I'm not going to stop writing songs. And if I keep writing songs and Patrick stays in town, I'm probably going to keep making records. And if I keep doing this, I'll get better at it because honestly, anything that you keep doing, you get better at. That's kind of how life works. Right. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, <laughs> What do I want out of music? And the answer to that question is, I would like someone to just give me a paycheck for making songs. Now, I'm not there yet. I, I do have, I do as best as I can on the business side, and that stuff's not fun, but I find that I have to do it. So I do. That's the stuff I got to force myself to do. Uh, so I made an LLC. I have a, a vendor license, so I'm legally allowed to sell stuff in my state. I pay mm -hmm. my state income tax, right? Any or sales tax. So like New York has a sales tax too, right? You sell whatever, if it's not food, the state says sales tax, you got to pay us this, right? I collect sales tax. And for a business in our state, uh, your state might vary wherever you might be. But in Ohio, you have to pay your uh, state sales tax every six months. So I pay my state sales tax every six months. Um, mm -hmm. All the T crossing and I dotting stuff I try to make sure all that's taken care of. I, ha I, I, I have all that done. Um, so I've, I'm putting in the work to eventually get to the point where I can make a regular living from doing something that I have to do. Um, um, I'm not there yet. Like I still have a corporate job with the Fortune 500 company and all that good stuff. And I don't do music on corporate job time because that's not cool. Um, but I would like to get to the point where I no longer have to do that for work and I can do something that I am compelled to do, but also something that I love to do uh, for a living. Notice I did not say anything about rich and famous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those are things that I'm not looking for. Famous doesn't sound like a good deal to me. Um, you lose your privacy. Um, like, I don't think famous people are generally all that happy, usually. And there's a lot yeah. of things that the famous person just can't do. Um, and there's a lot of stuff they have to deal with that a regular person doesn't want to have to deal with. I don't want to have to deal with any of that stuff. I just want to make, 
I want to be able to afford to eat and live in a, you know, where I live now would be fine, you know, just regular mm-hmm. life expenses, but I would like to pay those with music. That's my end goal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cool. And, and somehow you, you got, uh, you got past whatever um, self consciousness that might have lurked there in terms of like a lack of confidence in your music. Oh, it's totally on. still there. Totally still there. Uh, <laughs> I've just learned to ignore it. <laughs> That's great. To try to get better where I can. Um, I took piano lessons a few years ago to learn mm-hmm. how to better use that that tool. I'm taking voice Why? lessons right now because I'm um, really like I'm not a singer, but I feel like if I write a song and I put it on my record, I should be the one to sing it. That's just my personal thought on that matter. Um, and so if I'm going to continue to be the voice of my songs, I would I would like to be a better one. So I'm trying to improve. Right? So just constantly trying to get better. Uh, that doesn't mean everyone's always going to like what I do. And I'm, I'm, and I'm okay with criticism if it is reasonable. Um, <laughs> Criticism that's unreasonable is just painful and breaks our side little musician hearts, right? Yeah, it does. You mm-hmm. have, I mean, you have to learn how to deal with it, but it does hurt. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, sometimes I still get those little stings. And, you know, it makes you think about human psychology. It's like, why is there that negativity bias? You know, like 90 people could tell you how great you are and, and the 10 or even two that tell you that they don't like it. Of the ones you think about, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what the heck is that? But uh, yeah, I, I've noticed it's it's able to I mean, it's able to roll off me a little bit better now. I also seen in my own uh, evolution that um, I've become more comfortable in my own skin. Uh, I'm I'm 40 now, than even if just a few years ago. But I felt those few years ago when um, I might have been a little attacked a little bit more. It, I was just really experimenting with things that I didn't really want to do that didn't feel with me, but I felt I had to try before I ruled them out. You know, I, there's a lot of that along my path of like, I don't know, but I'm, I guess I got to try because people say X, Y, and Z, and I, I don't want to try it. But if I don't try, I won't know. So let me try, learn it's not for me, and then move on. So and the question for you. Sure. Sorry, I know this is your interview, but what you just <laughs> said made me think of a question. So if that situation came up again tomorrow, would you try the thing because you'll be better off for having the experience? Or would you say, you know what, I've done that stuff before and I know what I am now and I don't want to waste my time. And you would, would you steer clear? Like, how would you just, what would you do now if that same thing came up? Is my question. Yeah, great question. I, I would say for sure the second response. So right now at this stage, I, I'm, I feel uh, like I kind of understand my purpose. Uh, I, I'm satisfied with the purpose I understand about myself and I don't need to try on other people's ideas as much as I felt compelled to when I was younger. So yeah, I'm, I'm much more comfortable saying no, no, thank you. You know, a lot much more, no, much more no's in my uh, regular life nowadays. And that's good, I think, for me, you know. Uh, what about you, Mike? Do you feel that uh, you, if you feel that some information provided to you would be like maybe useful, but you don't really want to do it, you're not sure, how would you deal with that? I'm actually struggling with that right now. Um, but, but, well, I'll talk about musically specifically. Musically, so far, I've made the, I write the songs I want to write, and I've made the records I want to make, and they sound the way I want them to sound. That's not to say that I couldn't be convinced to do something else, but so far, I have been impervious to music business trends as far as mm-hmm. sonically and construction-wise, right? Um, the music that I write doesn't sound anything like what's hot right now or what's popular right now, mm-hmm. and that's fine. I'm cool with that. Uh, I think when you are an artist, you got to make the art you want to make first, because if not, it won't come off sincere. And then people, your audience will see through that. And that's not cool. Like when you're an independent artist, we depend like, like any business, you need customers, 
but we need to have a different relationship with our customers and our listeners. We need to be much more hands-on and make a much more emotional connection. And if I put something out that is insincere that I'm not feeling, people will notice that, and that's not cool. So, yeah. Now, as far as businessy stuff, here's a current example that I'm struggling with. Like, TikTok is apparently a huge music discovery tool for not our generation, but another generation. Mm -hmm. And of course, all of the distributors that distribute music, distributing platforms, distribute our music to TikTok. CD Baby does, for example. Yeah. So I know that my music is available on TikTok because CD Baby has sent it there. I don't have a presence there. I think I'm too old for that platform. It doesn't make sense to me. I don't get it. But I've been reading and, and listening to music discussion and there are a lot of intelligent people that say, if, as a musician, you should have a presence everywhere there's an audience. And there is an audience there. So I'm exactly at that crossroads. I do not want to. I, I want nothing to do with that platform. <laughs> However, what if somebody discovers my music and likes it because I decide to invest a little bit of time and energy into a presence on that platform. W would that even happen? How, how, it, would, it, would it be enough people to make it worth the time and emotional aggravation if I don't like it? So I'm in, I haven't decided yet. Um, I've, had, I've had this discussion briefly with artists um, with, via Twitter with, uh, I've seen some industry discussion on it. And also CD Baby has an article out um, on their website somewhere. I have a bookmark. But CD Baby actually uh, wrote something about how can you make the most of TikTok as a CD Baby artist. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of taking all that information in. And then at the end of the day, I have to decide whether I'm going to do it. Like my music's there. Maybe someone will find it without me having to do anything, but probably not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, right. Knowing the way things work. Yeah. What I really need to do is find a proxy, like some young person I know who loves TikTok that I can convince to make videos with my songs and then I don't have to. That would solve it for me. Um, <laughs> right. I don't think I know enough young people <laughs> to, to know one that really is in on that platform. And, and honestly, social media as a musician, it's a useful tool, but there are so many options and you can't execute them all well unless you have other people helping you, right? Like you, musicians that get to a certain point in their career have a team and that team handles their social posts for them. And I would love to do that, but I just can't afford to hire a team to handle social. Like if I had a team, I'd be everywhere and just let the team post, right? But yeah, it's all me so far. Right, no, I'm, I'm same boat. Uh, so hey, if anyone out there wants to help uh, Mike uh, Banghead with social media, uh, just as a, um, an experience-based thing, <laughs> and you're willing to... Do it for free for a while. Get you know, contact him. <laughs> yeah, please do. I'm looking for TikTok, uh, especially right now. Mm -hmm. But right, that so far I've decided I'm not going to make a personal account there. But I, mm -hmm. you know what? In three weeks, I might change my mind. We'll see. And um, and again, that's not about to me. That's not about going viral. Like TikTok's one of those platforms where going viral is a total thing. And there right. are people, like there's a couple of anecdotes by which I mean, you know, when you hear anecdote, it's probably one in a million people, right? But there are anecdotes of people whose songs have gone viral on TikTok and then they got a record deal like two weeks later. Um, and if your song goes viral enough, I mean, all of those platforms pay terribly as far as royalties, but a few million of whatever adds up. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's, again, that's not, I have to talk to myself. That's not what I'm in it for. I'm not in it mm -hmm. for being viral. I want, right. instead of just like, flavor of this 10 seconds i want that <laughs> listener who connects with my music and someday is going to buy a cd or a t-shirt or go to a show right i want a long time a long-term relationship with my audience yeah and that's like a fewer people but a longer relationship as opposed to all of the people for 10 minutes yeah Oh, yeah. Oh, I totally hear you, man. It's the this weird battle that we have, this weird dance that we're all kind of engaged in now as DIY artists of this era. <clears throat> um, Deanna, by the way, uh, says um, that, uh, Mike, I'm going to check out your music. Deanna's a, a friend of mine and uh, a high school friend of mine. And she says um, a few comments uh, that I'm part of a program for 30 days to boost my dancing on Instagram. 
So I guess there are, you know, cool ways to make use of these programs in a, in a healthy way. And she said, share my email, John, I can offer some tips so I can share yeah, please Deanna's email afterwards in terms of tips on how to use, I, I suppose, TikTok. She said she joined TikTok. So uh, anyway, you get some, uh, some in pointers there. I see am, if it's I am taking in all of the information prior to actually making a final decision. Yeah, that that's sounds quite wise. Um, I know from my from my work from my on my end, if you're curious, uh, no TikTok for me. Uh, I I um, was on Instagram for a while and uh, I liked it. I built it up to a couple hundred followers. Not that it didn't take me too long because I, I did it strategically. And then I stopped. I just felt like I, I want to go deep. I'm, I'm working on books right now. I'm writing my autobiography and uh, well, this book. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. And a book called Mind Your Music, which is about uh, the power of music and how it's all too easy to be caught up in music that's unhealthy or gray area. And that if we're not cautious to see where we're putting our energy, we, our energy can be pulled down through the music we're inadvertently exposing ourselves to. So that's what the book is about, Mind Your Music. Uh, anyway, that my autobiography, and I felt like if I don't dive, uh, if I don't go deep and do deep work, then I can't write my books. And social media is very shallow work. You know, it's not. It, it makes going deep very hard because the ping. Every, like, there's this. You ever hear the the um, TED talk called the uh, by, by a guy who talks about deep work? I think his book is called Deep Work. I have not. So anyway, what he he said his point is that if um, if you uh, if you go deep, right? Let's say you're doing writing, composing a song, or doing recording, or writing a book, something like that really involves your concentration, and then you get a ding. Let's say it's uh, an email comes in and your phone is on, or or a text message, even if it's positive, it doesn't have to be like bad news or anything. You it would st it still takes twenty minutes for your brain to go down to that level of depth of concentration that it was at before the ding came in because it, it's you know it's like throwing a pebble in the pond like it those ripples going to take as long as it's going to take to fizzle out you know so um so for me i always felt like for, for the past several years like damn i just want to go deep and i can never get deep enough to really con you know when you get in the groove and then it's like oh time's up it's like fuck <laughs> oops damn i i, I want to stay here so I've been like trying to give myself permission to do that. And so in that process, I've been removing things that take away from the tempt me not to do that. So I took out Instagram. I only do Facebook and YouTube. That's it. And, uh, you know, it's limited, but I'm growing. I feel like my, my tree is actually growing. I've got some subscribers and I feel like YouTube is a little different because people can come there anytime. It's not just yep. flavor of the month. It's like, oh, well, I know this thing exists. I can go find this resource there that I, you know, anyway, I'm just throwing that out. That, that's where I'm at. You know, I find on social media, um, I haven't figured out YouTube yet. I'm on it, but just for like, because the distributor puts the music there and then all my videos are there. Um, so my presence is only Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. And I, uh, on Facebook and Instagram, I keep my me page separate from my business page. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, for instance, I don't mind complete strangers connecting with me for my music, but I don't necessarily want complete strangers connecting to my personal page. Um, for me, the challenge of those three sites is the purpose of each of them is different. So in order to leverage them properly to promote your music, you have to leverage them differently, mm -hmm. and that takes time. Yeah. I am not as active on any of those sites as I could be, right? Like, because they... They say if you're on Instagram, you should be posting daily. Uh, when you're on Twitter, you should be posting daily. Um, if you're on Facebook and you do music, you should be posting daily, and I don't. Mm -hmm. um, so I've decided, and part of that is what you just explained. It's just just vacuums up your time and energy, right? Um, mm -hmm. I'm a lot more active when I have something to promote, and I'm trying to work on being more consistent even when I don't have something to promote because I think you turn people off if you're always selling to them. Um, but more consistent would be my goal for those platforms not necessarily every day but at least steady mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I hear you. Uh, so Deanna said, Mike, it's hard to hear you. So I don't know if you could uh, speak up or I don't, you don't think you can hear, raise your mic volume or anything. Right? I can. I just. Oh, okay. I mean, I can hear you fine, but. Uh, I just got to if... figure out which button, which uh, knob on the thing he does that. Okay. Yeah. On my end, basically, uh, I'm hearing you fine, but, you know, people are listening to on different devices and stuff. So. All right. Um, I'll just make sure I always, I think I've been kissing the microphone the entire time, but I'll continue doing that. And I just turned the volume up a little bit. I don't want to crush anybody's ears. No, I appreciate that. Okay. Yeah. Sound, sounds good. I mean, sounds all right to me, but uh, you know, a different device is going to sound different. Yep. I also turned right. the room light on because as you uh, noted earlier, it was sunny and now it's not. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Um, all right, cool. So, uh, so Mike, I've visited your websites as well as your social media, and have listened to your music. It has some, di a di it has a diverse sonic spectrum, catchy bass and guitar work, uh, thoughtful lyrics. What has your journey been like in developing your skills as a songwriter and recording artist? Uh, for the songwriter part, it's just about reps. Uh, keep doing it, keep doing it, and for the recording part, the same. Uh, and I think if people have the time to actually go back and listen to all my catalog, which you can for free at my website, um, you can on streaming services too, but there's a whole uh, album that's not on the streaming services that, but is on my website for free. Uh, I think if you listen in chronological order, you can see that I'm growing as a songwriter and that I've better expressing um, the arranging and outputting of the songs from the recording process. And I think that is due to knowing what I'm doing. When I, when I made that first album, I didn't have studio experience and I relied a lot on not just the engineer, but the other musicians that I convinced to come record with me. Um, and then, so when I was ready to make more music after having done it before, I knew the process. I, again, thinking about best practices, I did more research on how to better be prepared. And I had a better plan of attack going into my second album than I did my debut album. So on both of those counts, just doing the work and getting more reps in the situation um, has helped me. It's a challenge because I'm a solo guy and I make what mostly guitar music. I mean, I have some piano ballads, but the guitar, I'd say 80 to 90% of the songs is what speaks the loudest, right? And I don't play guitar, even though I write guitar music. Um, so I write the guitar parts on piano. Uh, I can't just give a guitarist a bass line. I tend to do goofy things with my bass lines and not only hammer away on the roots. I like to play dissonant stuff like fourths under suspended chords or sevenths or just I do goofy stuff that sometimes guitarists like, oh, why are you playing it that way? Trust me, it'll work. Um, <laughs> so I write the guitar parts on piano and then I just, when I'm writing at home, I have to imagine, all right, what, in, what instruments do I want? How do I want to build this sonically? And that's a challenge when I don't have the ability to play it for myself. So there are a lot of things that I discover in the studio where, oh, that doesn't work. Or the, either the engineer or the musician that's coming in might have an idea that I didn't think of. And I try to let people, if they have a sonic idea for texture or whatever, let them go ahead and do it. Um, better to record it and get rid of it if I don't like it than not record it and wish I had done it, right? So mm -hmm. we do record a lot of ideas. And for the most part, they end up, they end up working. But I think the more that I do this, the better it's going to get. And I think that makes sense. Like, I know it's a little cliche how artists always say, this is the best thing I've ever made. Impressed. But honestly, if it's not, why are you putting it out? Right? Yeah. Like, if I, like, the album I just put out is the best album I've ever made. And I believe in it and I'm proud of it. But if I make another one and I don't think it's as good as the one I put out in 2019, guess what? I need to work harder on my songwriting. <laughs> you know? Like if it's if it's not at least on par with the one I just did, I am not putting in the work the way I should. I hear you, and I get that. Also, sounds a bit like your perfectionist coming out. Yeah, that is. Um, so Deanna says, uh, "What is it like in Ohio?" I'm curious. What, what, what's what's dating like uh, these days? And uh, she said, "I used to compose music on GarageBand. Yeah, uh, GarageBand is great." Yeah, I've never used that because I'm not an Apple person, so I've uh, uh. never never used that. Um, what's Ohio like? 
That's a hard question to answer coming from a New Yorker. Uh, now, see, I've been to the city, uh, and I, like we discussed before we got online, I have, I have an uncle that lives in the city, and uh, I've been there many, many times. Uh, we don't have any cities in our state that are as big as New York. We have three that are pretty big. Like the three biggest cities in our state have millions, million plus people in them, but nothing as huge as New York. But um, Ohio is a great place to live. I uh, I grew up here, and I've done enough travel um, that I've seen lots of other places, and that's what makes me realize this is not a terrible place to live. The cost of living is low. Now, the salaries are also low because the cost of living is low, but it's very affordable to live here. Um, people are generally friendly. It's reasonably safe-ish. I mean, there's no such thing as a place that's 100% safe. Um, mm -hmm. Just, In fact, almost exactly two years ago from now, two years and a couple of days ago, there was a mass shooting in Dayton uh, where mm. um, somebody with an AK uh, or AR-15 killed nine people. And, and oh, wow. Uh, in our entertainment district. I was out of town that weekend, but I mean, this is my home and I'm it's something that none of us who live here will ever forget, but that could happen literally anywhere. It does happen, I mean, in the United States, disclaimer, in the United States, <laughs> that could happen anywhere um, from right. a grocery store to a library, to a school. To, so, I mean, there's no such thing as safe, but Ohio is a pleasant place to live that doesn't have too terribly many environmental or weather related disasters. It's not remotely as diverse as New York, unless you get around our larger cities where there's uh, college campuses, and then mm -hmm. you'll see some more diversity. But um, I like it. I like it here. Mm. Cool. It's yeah. probably not the answer Deanna was looking for. Uh, perhaps, Deanna, if you ask a more specific question, I'll, <laughs> say some, I'll say a more intelligent answer. No, that's great. I, you gave me a good, gave us a good uh broad sweeping concept of what Ohio might feel like compared to to New York, for example. The buildings are smaller. There's a lot less concrete and a lot more green stuff. <laughs> the city is, it's a unique place to, to, to grow up and live, I would imagine, in a city as large as New York, where, you know, you stroll through one neighborhood and it's all Dominicans, and you stroll through another neighborhood and it's all not Dominicans, and, you know, <laughs> you, you you got Central Park, which is green, but then there's plenty of the city where you don't see anything green at yeah. all. And right. the buildings are unimaginably high, even just the regular ones where people live and not the skyscrapers downtown. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a unique place. And you can get any kind of food you want from all over the world. That's my favorite thing about New York City, by the way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> at pretty much any time of day you want, uh, that is not the case here. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, yeah. So Deanna says, uh, thanks. That was a clear answer. So, um, cool. So I understand that you're a natural poet. And uh, so how long have you been composing poetry? Was that before you started music? And what is poetry? How is, you know, what does it mean to you? Yeah, way before I could eat, basically as soon as I could write. Uh, it, and, and I was an avid reader as a child. And I would read poetry and think, oh, I could do that. Poetry, um, not all of it, but some of it's really musical. Looking at you, Edgar Allan Poe, um, mm -hmm. right? That's uh, that sing-songy rhyming stuff that he did. Very musical. Bells. Yeah. Yeah, it's art with words. And yeah. before I could make music, I mean, I was never, ever any good at painting or drawing. Um, so, as a child, if I wanted to be artistic. Um, poetry it was and now none of the stuff I wrote as a child was remotely anything close to resembling good <laughs> but art's good for your brain right um, oh yeah just the process of just creating, the process right? now as I got older um here's a secret I guess it's not a secret if I'm going to say it on this podcast but uh I have recycled some of the poetry I wrote as a late teenager so 18 19 into song lyrics um mm -hmm. Now, some editing has to be done. Yeah. Um, in fact, I'll give you an example. I put out a single in 2019 called Little Light, and that was based on a poem that I wrote in, like, 97. And mm -hmm. I had to modernize. There was, a, there was a part of that original poem about writing a letter, and kids don't do that anymore, so I updated it <laughs> to email. Right? Updated it to email and just kind of went through it and made changes to make it fit into a, a lyric structure, fit with the music I was writing. Um, but as far as, for the I mean, it's 90% unchanged. So I do, I mean, most of the stuff I wrote as a teenager is garbage. 
but I still have all of it. And when I am on the rare occasions, I don't have an idea of something I want to write, or if I mm -hmm. just want a different idea than the ones I have, um, I pull that out because then I can get in the headspace of, oh, I remember exactly why I felt that bad this day, or I remember that heartbreak situation or that thing that happened to me as a teenager that I would be chill about now. But again, when you're a teenager, you can't deal with anything correctly. So um, mm. it's good to get me in that headspace because I feel that I write better when I'm writing something that's not happy, uh, mm -hmm. which is probably not cool. But like mm -hmm. when I write happy songs, they sound just awful and none i don't share any of that um <laughs> i just they just never get to my this is good level mm -hmm. maybe someday but for some reason <laughs> depressing or sad or angry when it comes to lyrics i can make that work better <laughs> mm -hmm. um so i have songs where if you don't listen to the lyrics you might think the song is upbeat and mm -hmm. that's, on that's on purpose by the way Okay. But then you mm -hmm. but then you pay attention to the lyrics and you're like, oh, this is messed up. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I fell into that, uh, I don't want to say a trap, but um, yeah, because some of your music, if you're not listening carefully, it's not, you know, it, it's it's there's not dark, heavy music, you know, overall. It's it it's kind of like I would say, you know, a bit gray area. You're not sure what the mood is, maybe, but but a lot of it could be close to to happy to me. I mean, not, it doesn't exactly sound like happy music, but upbeat, you know, positive. But uh, yeah, if you listen closer to the lyrics, perhaps it's a yeah. different story. But. Yeah, the when I write a song that's not slow, I want you mm -hmm. nod in your head, like get in, feel the groove, get into it. Um, man, if you're not listening to the words, which mm -hmm. you, know, you don't have to listen to the words, but some people don't. Yeah, some people don't, and I envy them. Because it'd be so nice, then I can't avoid, I can't ignore it. I'm, you know, as a lyricist and singer. Yeah. But uh, yeah, some people don't listen to words, and they'll tell me, "Oh, yeah, I love that song." I'm like, "Do or whatever the song is." And have you listened to, to the words? No, not really. No, I guess you could love it then, <laughs> if you, you know. Yeah, I want people to listen to the words, but I also want people who don't to enjoy it. And I guess that's one of the right. Say something horribly sad, but with the not horribly sad music that said i do usually write in minor um mm -hmm. it's just not always dirgy sounding minor but uh mm -hmm. I, I feel more comfortable writing in minor keys yeah well you know uh smashing pumpkins was like that right yep a lot of minor stuff and they're they could be a little wishy-washy and not sure exactly what you're supposed to feel but the lyrics would generally pretty heavy very very rare occasionally they would write something that would be qualified as happy but uh and those are actually i liked some of the happy songs but um the cure you, you listen to the cure much yep 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 used to not not as much anymore but um obviously um i think billy corgan loves the cure you can hear some of that influence and in, mm -hmm. yeah i would think so because yeah they, they remind me of that concept of like create like i find cure music very uplifting but the lyrics are not. And so essentially it's not uplifting. And, and I, I would say to anyone, be careful that I listen to too much of their music uh, for too long, because it will, it could bring you down. But um, but yeah, I, I found it to be very beautiful really. And, but yeah, there's this like desperation, very like romantic desperation. You use a lot of the words, the word always and the word never, right? <laughs> and, and yeah, Robert absolutes, Smith's lyrics. Are, absolutes are tough. Um, <laughs> But right, I think sometimes if that's what you feel, right, you um, they say write what you know. And yes, as a songwriter, there are times when you are not writing from your own perspective, you're writing a fictional story. And I do that as well. Um, but there are times when I'm writing something that came from my feelings and it's just, it's not happy. Doesn't mm -hmm. mean the music has to sound like that though. I mean, it just really depends on what I'm doing when I sit at the piano. Mm -hmm. But usually, um, I mean, I don't compose in a vacuum usually I have a purpose and the lyrics and the music work together to express what I'm trying to express. So my favorite listener would be one that listens to the lyrics, but not at, not at the, not to exclude what's going on musically. I mean, I wouldn't, I want any listener to be, to be honest, any listener welcome. But like my favorite listeners are the ones that listen to what I'm doing musically and what I'm doing with lyrically. And I try to make sure that neither one of them are boring. Because mm -hmm. 
when wow. when I listen to modern music, what I don't like about a song is when I can hear the first verse and chords and know where every or just hear the first verse and know where the chords is going to go. Right? There's certain songwriting cliches, and I really try to avoid those. And if I find myself falling into one, I try to do something completely goofy. Mm-hmm. From, a music, from a musician, this is how songs should be written standpoint, right? Um, I use weird chords. Sometimes I don't even have a chorus. Uh, <laughs> I mean, right? The songwriting quote experts will tell you, get to the chorus as fast as you can in 20 seconds. All right, how about if I just don't have one? Then? <laughs> um, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I just, I just, I would, that's the worst. Like, I, I understand that people don't like my music, but I think I would be, most hurt if someone said that my music bored them. Mm-hmm. I feel like as a songwriter, I'm not doing my job right. Mm-hmm. Right. Or if they said it's not unique or something like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Deanna is sharing that uh, she says, unfortunately, my best original work is Catharsis from Tough Times. I imagine you might be able to agree with that. Absolutely. Catharsis is really important. Um, mm-hmm. And like we said earlier, sometimes you have to write it because it needs to come out of you. Doesn't mean you have to share it though. Yeah, and, right. That's there true. Are, there is stuff that I've written that you're just not going to hear. Yeah, I, that reminds me of there's some songs like kind of breakup songs that I had in the vault that uh, they're whiny, they're moany. They're, some are actually quite good, but I'm just not going to release them. They're too personal. And I feel like if I release them, then I have to relive it all the time. And there's no point. Uh, yeah. And some of them are just a little too much, you know. Um, from my point of view. Uh, yeah, so um, so poetry, do you still compose poetry? No, I spend all my energy on lyrics nowadays. Um, in fact, if I write song lyrics and I think they are too close to poetry, I go straight to the revision bucket. And, um, you know, people that don't do music might, might not quite catch that poetry and song lyrics are not necessarily the same thing. Um, sometimes poetry can work as song lyrics. But sometimes mm-hmm. it really doesn't. Yeah, very true. Um, really depends on the kind of poem. But no, there there are times when I when I write lyrics, and I'll say that's way too close to being a poem, and it's not really like I can't see myself singing this. I don't think it'll connect with an audience. It's not, or it's just not good enough. And then out comes the editor, which is good. You need to self edit, I think. Hmm. Do you, do you, is it important for your poetry to rhyme? No. No, okay. I like it when it rhymes, but um, and I think this is something that makes that is different from when I was younger. When I was younger, I would try to force the rhyme as much as possible. Mm-hmm. But now, poetry and lyrics, um, rhyming is great, but if it comes at the expense of clarity or cleverness, that's not good to me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. For sure. I, I barely rhyme nowadays. Sometimes in the mood. Uh, but I, I, when I learned it, with the the where I learned to really let go of the impulse to rhyme was um, I've been practicing Buddhism for 12 years now. And the third president of our organization, the SGI, is Daisaki Keita. He's a prolific writer and uh, of books and he, a lot of poetry. And whenever you read his poetry, it's been translated from Japanese, so it never rhymes. And But they always like, uh, the organization which shares his poetry very proudly, like this is, you know, from our mentor. Uh, who, who we do many of us regard as a mentor and it is beautiful poetry because of the it's come from the, the higher mind really you know really to for the human spirit and I would enjoy, appreciate these poems and for me they never felt like poems because I'm not reading them in the original language maybe but then I learned to just see it differently and then I started to write in that kind of just very free vein like what do I want to say and just say it uh, so I still write poetry and I, I still gather my poetry from recent years. I'd like to put out some poetry books myself. I think a lot of lyricists must be poets, right, at some point. Yeah, probably. Um, here's something I can take from what you just shared. The interpreter had the choice to put in the work to make those rhyme. Yeah. However, it was probably at the expense of clarity. Mm-hmm or at the expense of straying too far from what the original intent of the untranslated work was. Mm-hmm. Because there are poems that get interpreted 
and they end up rhyming in the new language. Mm -hmm. And that's a separate, like as an interpreter, just interpreting it or translating is one thing, but then redoing that translation so that it sounds rhymy in the target language is a completely second step. And I find it interesting that for the works that you just described, the person who did the translation made the choice as an, I mean, you could call it an artistic choice mm -hmm. to do the translation as best as they could and not fool with trying to shoehorn it into a rhyming structure. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it, it, see, it feels very pure to me, the, the way the poems read, like this is what was in the author's heart, you know. And uh, it kind of made me feel like, yeah, poetry, and the Odesakwi Keita, this, the, this poet who I'm talking about, uh, who I regard as a mentor uh, in life, a life mentor, always speaks about the importance of the poetic spirit and that, you know, to keep it alive, especially in this age where it's kind of like, rare on rare for people on their walk home from work or wherever they're going at nighttime this pause and look up at the moon and just commune with the moon and think of a verse you know but that that he would argue that that shouldn't be lost that that that's like really that's a crucial element of our humanity is that poetic spirit i feel like that's probably hard in new york you got so many lights i don't know how you'd be able to see it <laughs> yeah we can see the moon uh but beyond that <laughs> yeah maybe five stars it's about all we got yeah um so let's see uh how has your tastes and perspectives relating to music shifted and evolved over the years do you still listen to the same bands you used to or i do but not as often and there are things that i used to not listen to that i do listen to now once i started learning how to play and listening to music differently from the first of all huh, how do I play that? That was part of the thing. And then also noticing in more detail how the pieces fit. Um, then I started listening more closely to some of my parents' music that I just really didn't pay a lot of attention to as a young person. And I found, I'm found i finding a lot more value in music that otherwise I hadn't given a chance before. Mm -hmm. And I mean, nowadays, there is definitely a, a genre or a family of genres of music that I prefer, but I do try to listen to music outside of my regular preferences because I think the more things you listen to, the more ideas you can take and use as a writer, the more mm -hmm. interesting that makes you as a writer. Um, and so I have actually a list of stuff I need to get around to listening to that I don't necessarily know anything about, <laughs> but I would like to learn about it because maybe there's something I can take there and use it in my own writing. Um, and if you do that correctly, it's not plagiarism. I'm not talking about just copying note for note a melody or whatever, but um, ideas and kind of the way that, uh, especially if I'm learning uh, songs from 20, 30 years ago on bass, um, a lot of the bass, and I was just explaining this to someone the other day, a lot of the bass players from my favorite band from the 90s were not the songwriters. Um, now, I, I'm different, I am the songwriter, Mm -hmm. um, but I find it interesting. I can take ideas from these bass players from the 90s, how they were supporting the songwriter's chord structure, because most of them would write their own accompanying part to the song. And I can take some ideas from that and incorporate it into my own songwriting. Or, um, And also that might help me to approach bass a little bit more conventionally sometimes, because I don't think I write bass lines like a regular normal bass player, because I'm mm -hmm. trying to be weird. Um, and sometimes conventional is good. The reason it's right. conventional is because it usually works, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you don't want to be completely wacky all the time, but I mm -hmm. have definitely taken some ideas um, from, uh, we talked about Nirvana earlier. I was uh, learning, a, I was learning on a plane recently and what Chris Novoselic does in that bass line, it moves around a lot, but um, he basically plays a very similar thing, just kicks it up an octave and then changes just a couple of notes on one of the fills. Mm -hmm. It's simple. But it sounds really cool in the recording. And until I sat down to learn the song, I never noticed that's what he was doing. Mm -hmm. but I just learned the song last week, even though this is a song I've known since I was like in my teens. And then I thought, you know what? I'm probably going to have to steal that idea sometime for a song. Like just, mm -hmm. uh, instead of just repeating the same bass line in the verse uh, every other time through the verse, knock it up an octave and maybe do one or two note substitutions on a fill. And so like stuff like that. No one, now when I execute this, no one will know I still look from Chris Novoselic, but me. Right. But, oh, yeah, for sure. Because mm -hmm. it's the concept that I'm taking, not, not the exact notes, right? But there's a whole lot of that stuff everywhere. 
and even music I don't really like, I've been trying to at least listen to some of it every now and then. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I, I have a lot to say on that. I do want to uh, let you know Deanna's question, which is, do you like dream theater? Yes, but I haven't been exposed to them enough to be familiar with their music. I remember being my first job when I was in my first like corporate world job when I was in high school. I worked in a call center and one of my coworkers was a love dream theater. And so he always had it on. And I remember it sounded really like I'm gonna say the word operatic as far as the guitars, and there was lots of layering and just way too much going on, and it just seemed way too big for me. Um <laughs> I've probably, through osmosis, listened to maybe two or three of their albums. Mm -hmm. That's one of those bands that now that I know how to play, because I did not know how to play them, now that I know how to play and I've recorded music, I should probably pick one and sit down with it with headphones and give it the critical listen. You know, the one like the what can I learn from this listen as opposed to listening for fun. Um, okay. Right, that's right. one of those bands that I, I should revisit as homework. Yeah, I, I would I would say that would be worthwhile. I mean, the bass player is fantastic. Um, images and words would be my recommendation. I imagine she might. Images and words or awake would be the album to start with. I'm gonna write that down because if I don't, I'll forget it. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah, those are some killer albums. Um, in terms of uh, listening to uh, not your favorite music, uh, I've been in this mode for for a long time now. And um, so I, I'm in this unique situation where people give me stuff, musical stuff. I've got a lot of guitars that people just give me or basses or uh, records, lots of records that people gave me um, because they don't know what to do with them. And I'm willing to take them uh, and give them a home. And then maybe uh, I sell them in a garage sale, whatever. But I do listen. I make an effort to listen to everything I get. So awesome. it's not like I'm getting my favorite albums or anything. I'm getting whatever collection, you know, so I might get a lot of Frank Sinatra and the old Italian singers and uh, it could be Christmas stuff. It could be uh, uh, old jazz, you know. So I just I just make sure that, that all the records work. So if I sell it for a dollar, I could say, well, I know it works. So then I put it on front, put it on back. I love it because it's closed system. I still, I still listen to cassettes in the garage all the time. Uh, and because when you listen to Spotify, you listen to any of the, the platform stuff, there's a potential for uh, commercials, depending on how you're listening to it. And there's a potential that you're going to look at the freaking thing and you're going to be tempted to change the artist. But like you said, you used to just press play, and the whole album goes. And you, you can do that much better if it's a closed system, if there's nothing, no outside interference it's just you and that you know piece of media so yep. i have my record play here when i was writing through this past spring and winter every day i just listen to record after record because i have a bunch and i would just put a little sticker like okay this record plays okay and sometimes i'll find what i like you know an artist i just didn't know about um but i just listen to so much stuff and i'm pretty sure next time i write a song it's kind of like just be infused with this these random influences that I'm allowing in, you know, because I'm not. It makes you more well-rounded as a musician, honestly. Mm -hmm. It's not I, general you, not just you, but all of us, right? Yeah, right. Sure. Like to listen to music that's really focused on the vocal. It's all about the vocalist, you know, like the Frank Sinatra and the whole crooner era. It's all about the vocal. And then there's females in that line too. And to think, wow, music that's just really about that, and it's creating this atmosphere. Like, you know, you hear it when you hear a Frank Sinatra song, it's got this atmosphere. It's kind of sultry. It's kind of like, you know, it almost makes you feel like it's Christmas, even if it's not a Christmas song, you know, it puts you in this mood. And it's just interesting to know how, what is it that does that, you know, as, to, as a musician to learn that. And I think even as a writer, um, all these influences help me to write in a certain way, or just at least help me to identify that, okay, you could do things this way, that way, the other way. So when I do things my way, that's fine because that's my voice, you know? Kind of gives me more confidence in my voice, you know? Talking about Sinatra and saying my way. I knew that was mm -hmm. somewhere. <laughs> and I actually didn't plan it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Deanna says Hall and Oates. Um, yeah, they're incredible songwriters. Um, yeah, and she said that Dream Theater is a perfect blend of metal and conventions of classical music. 
Yeah, so yeah, so warning, if you're gonna listen to Dream Theater, you might want to do it like you do classical music, just you and the and the headphones concentrating for a while if you can make that time. Yeah. All right, moving on. Uh, you got are you good on time? I got a few more yeah, questions as for long you. As, as long as you want to go. All right, cool. So um so being a human being and a creative person can be challenging. Uh, can you explain what it is that motivates you or drives you to continue to share your artistry despite any challenges that you might encounter along the way? I mean, you already said you can't not, but if there's I anything else not, to add to that. But the can't not is more about creating it. I could always create it and just decide no one's ever going to hear a song. Right, ever exactly. Again. Um, mm -hmm. So part of that is could is telling yourself that you've that i've made telling myself i should probably first person this that i've made something of enough value that it is worthy of being shared um first i have to make something of value that is worthy to be shared and we've already discussed that i have perfectionist tendencies so not everything that i write hits that bar but as humans we are social creatures and sharing is you know, an artist's way of sharing, if I was a painter, I would paint a pretty a scenery, well, whatever, still life or abstract, or, but the artist makes the painting and they don't generally just leave it in their house, right? They put it in a gallery where people could see it because this is what they're sharing their personality and their inner selves with people. Well, when you make music, if you don't play live, the way that we share is to go record it and then let people hear the recording. Mm -hmm. That's my art. I don't know how to do anything else artistically. Um, so I'm going to keep doing that as long as I keep making art that I think is good enough to be shared. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that means turning off the inner critic. Uh, one of my favorite musicians from Dayton said to me once, if it sounds good, it is good. And that sounds really simple. <laughs> but sometimes, again, I'll get down on myself and be like, is this even, is it even worth it? But then I have to step back, imagine the full band arrangement and say, if 16 year old me was at the mall and walked into the music store and this was on the speakers, would 16 year old me be stoked about this song? And if the answer is yes, he would, then it's good enough. <laughs> That's cool. Sometimes the answer is no, he wouldn't. He wasn't sophisticated enough for that yet. And that's fine because there right. are some songs that I write that probably 16 year old me would be like, nah, but. Mm -hmm. Right. Your, your target audience isn't always a 16 year old, right? Not always, but often a lot that of works. the time it is 16 year old Mike. Wow. Cool. Well, it helps to have a clear, you know, person that you're writing for. Um, it's always been hard for me when they say like create your. Your What's avatar. The word avatar yeah, yeah. It's, it's... i've got a couple of different avatars um but my main avatar is actually not me but my main avatar is just supportive even if i do something out of left field like put out a song that sounds like salsa which i did this year um but it's got a cool groove and it's catchy and the avatar will see past not understanding the spanish lyrics and groove along to the you know to the jam so mm -hmm. i might i might be uh within that avatar of yours because yeah i mean i like world music but but yeah, I, I like when an artist just keeps that, that's what I want to, you know, one of the things I appreciate about you and about DIY artists in general, perhaps similar to our vein, is that you create music that sp speaks from your soul to to your soul. You're writing for yourself. You, you're writing a six-year-old mic, but that's still you, right? Yep. So that that's kind of that's kind of beautiful. And I hear it when when I listen to your music, it sounds like it's coming from a fan of this certain type of like nineties alternative music, you know, because it is. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you. You get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what I hear, you know? And, uh, and it sounds like, it sounds like that's style of music, which I'm sure you'd be happy to know because that's the style of music you always loved. So. Yep. Now that doesn't mean I'm going to write like that all the time, but mm -hmm. I'm probably always going to go back there at some point. Yeah. I, and, yeah. I would guess so, yeah. And there are some slower, more ballad-like things I heard too, you know. And it, it's interesting that piano is your main writing tool, is that right? Yes, these days. Because mm -hmm. being a bass player, I, I would guess that you just write on bass, but uh, you tell me piano, so. 
Yeah, nowadays, well, mostly mostly piano because I have to tell the other musicians that come into the studio the full chord flavor. Mm-hmm. That's a little bit more challenging when you're just playing a bass line. So mm-hmm. um, there are songs that I've written. In fact, I'll give you an example. The, the song from my last record called She Speaks the Metaphor, which is basically features bass line. Um, I wrote that on bass. Mm-hmm. But these days, it's pretty rare when I only write a song on bass because I have to think, all right, I got to tell the guitarist what I want to do here. And like one example, I love writing, sus- I love suspended chords because I'm mm-hmm. a big fan of dissonance because mm-hmm. the, the anxious and depressed person inside of me likes that kind of uneasy feeling that suspended chords bring. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I resolve them the way that music theory says you should for a happy ending. Sometimes I don't, but I just like to use them because they make and that dissonant but so sometimes i'll throw in a sus4 chord but play like the four under it on the bass line <laughs> and i have found that when i'm in the studio that breaks guitarist brains oh yeah that disorienting i can imagine wanna, because you know i don't i don't think or write like a guitarist mm-hmm. and <laughs> you know when you record you record the bass first so i've got on paper i want you to play this chord and they hear what i'm playing and they don't want to play the chord that i've assigned <laughs> no. I have to tell them no no trust me it'll sound fine like, it'll sound the way I want it. You just have to trust that it'll sound the way I want it to sound. But that's why I compose on piano is because I'm thinking of telling other musicians later the chord flavors I want. Um, and also, it's gotten me to be to venture into sevenths and ninths and, and more jazzy. I mean, we say jazzy chords because most rock guitarists don't want to go past one through five, right? But, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, you, get, you add like a fourth note in there, you're venturing into jazz, and you shouldn't do that as a rock artist. But um, some of those chords have interesting flavor and character, and I think it's fun to fiddle with that stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh yeah. I, I, uh, I, I love sus chords. I love sus two. I love sus four, eight nines, you know. Um, but like the, talking about that particularly uh, disorienting chord, there's one chord I really like, which is, let's say if you play F sharp minor, right? Mm-hmm. And then maybe drop down to E major, then D major seven, and then pull the, uh, well, I'm thinking on guitar, but uh, put the, um, the five of the D major seven to G sharp. So I guess D major seven, flat five. Oh, um that's a oh. tasty chord d major seven or any major seven flat five is a really sweet spot to hang out in it's very uncomfortable in a when what i regard as a pleasant way so usually when i play with a flatted fifth everyone that doesn't write music is like tuning out right now but i don't care <laughs> this is the stuff that i like talking about this nerdy stuff usually when i flat the fifth i've also flatted the third which makes it a diminished yeah um I've never, I don't think I've ever messed around with keeping the third major and flatting the fifth. And that is, I, you just, I have a new toy. <laughs> John, you've given me a new toy. I'm yes, this is a new toy. With that. So uh, a flatted, basically a major seven chord, but flat the fifth. And that, that yeah. gives you, I mean, I guess that puts, that makes it like a major third between the fifth and the seventh instead of a minor third, right? Between the fifth, the piano, but... fifth and the seventh. Though. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. That'd be a. Uh, it'd be like a perfect years. fourth. It'd oh, be okay. a perfect fourth between the the fifth and the seventh. I took my electric piano out and put it in the closet, cause, so I would look at it in order to see it. But now I have to. I'm better when I see it. Um, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna play with that. I like learning about like. I mean, it's not new, but it's new to me. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So let's say, for example, you take the D major seven, flat five, then maybe you, you can kind of. I, I, what I like to do is I like to play with the five. So I play it regularly, D major seven, and then flat the five, then maybe mm. back, and then kind of resolve it to F sharp minor or some F sharp minor seven, F sharp minor 11, F sharp minor nine. Any of those feels nice in this kind of like unstable stability, you know? Yeah, because I mean, you're turning the third to the root there, and then uh, that A, which you were flatting. That's really where the res- that's probably I think the A is where people would hear the resolution, right? Um, yeah, yeah. It's it's fun. That 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 particular progression. So have uh, have some fun with that. That's awesome. <laughs> cool. Uh so um so next question. Uh on Deanna says that I need to learn advanced music theory again. <laughs> well, the thing is that's not even really advanced, which is the <laughs> Yeah, right. It's 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 relatively uh 
I mean, I learned music theory. I'm completely self-taught, um, which you didn't ask. But like I, when I started learning, I was books from the internet. And then I just read as much on the internet about theory I could find. And a lot of, especially rock musicians, don't either don't bother. Or, I mean, I just know it from osmosis. But I'm one of those nerdy people that needs to understand why things work in order to do them. Like, I'm not a gifted musician. I had to work really hard and learn my instrument and learn how it worked before I could start writing. That's just the way my brain works. So I read as much as I could about theory, and I try to understand it as best as I can. And so I feel like if I understand it, it's not going to be advanced because I don't really... I haven't um, been formally trained, and I don't think I really get the super advanced stuff. Um, but I do know how chords work. Um, and I found from being around other musicians who just hear stuff and know what's going on, I can describe it in speech better than I can hear it and play it. Um, and I know musicians that can play all the chords in the guitar, but can't tell you how a chord is built. Mm-hmm. And I can't right. play any of them on guitar because I don't play guitar. But I, I've studied music theory enough that if you hand me a piano, I can tell you a major is this. And by a minor, you flat the third. And if you flat the third and the fifth, it's a diminished. And if you take out the third and out a fourth, that's a suspended fourth. Like, so I know how they're all constructed. And I think having those pieces is useful for me. Not everyone mm-hmm. needs to know that stuff to be a really good musician. I need to know that stuff just to even do it. Mm-hmm. Putting good aside, like I can't even begin to... <laughs> I would not have been able to get started had I not learned all that stuff. Mm, okay, I see. Yeah, I mean, to, to be fair, Deanna's laughed, laughed and said that uh, to me, it's, it's very advanced. Um, I, I would say that I was impressed. I was surprised you were just able to pick up and say, and you actually were telling me what notes were in there. I, I think most people I would speak to, musicians, especially if they didn't have formal training, uh, wouldn't get that so i would say it is pretty advanced more than i my what i'm used to but uh yeah I mean, so all i did was do the reading and um uh, and i guess i should all right this is me not giving myself credit because i uh i have been doing um there's a, there's a show i'm doing on, on soon and i had to recruit a band and uh one of the gentlemen in the band really good guitarist uh really good songwriter but one of the songs of mine that he's playing rhythm guitar on is one of those ones where I have him playing a sus four and I play the fourth under it. And he would always just play the root because he listened to the record and he hears, he hears the bass and he wants to play the root. And I'm like, nah. I'm like, no, I can tell you that on the record, we played a sus four and I'm playing the fourth under it. And then I said, you know, it's an, it's a, I just forgot. It said the first one's a C sus four. So like the, I'm playing, I'm playing an F, right? Um, and he's, I said, C sus four. He's like, I don't even know what that is. I'm like, oh, it's a C, F, and G. But like, it's piano me saying that, not bass player me, right? Because right, like, right, right. it looks, the, it's the same on a bass, but I'm not playing all three of those on a bass ever. I mean, uh-huh. one of the three, right? Um, right. And in this case, I'm playing the F because I want that, I want that distorted, that, that dissonant sound. But like, well, yeah, I mean, I see it when I started learning how to play piano. It just made, it just made more sense because of the linear. It's weird. The exact same notes in my bass, because they're arranged differently. I saw it differently. And I'm like, yeah, all I got to do is not play with that finger, but play with that one. And then now I've got a sus four. Uh, so mm-hmm. wherever you are on your guitar, find a C, F, and G and play those. And don't play any of the other notes on there. I know you guitarists have all these strings that you have to play, but don't play. Um, yeah, it was, it's just, it was interesting having to try to communicate that to somebody who's not. But like I tell him C minor, he's got, yeah, I know what that is. But... He, just, he didn't know C sus four? Yeah. And then, mm-hmm. but if you don't use it, yeah, well, right. If that's just not part of you, haven't sat down and read about it for hours like some nerds of us have. Mm-hmm. I just thought one 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 way to get around potentially the guitarist resistance to doing the <laughs> the C sus four when you're playing an F is to title it C sus four slash F. I know? have learned like the way it is in piano notation. Mm-hmm. I I have learned that I need to start doing that. Yeah, I think that would make us feel better. Like if I if I saw that's the chord and then you're playing the F, I'm like, I'll be totally happy with it. Usually, like, when okay. I write a, usually when I write a chord chart, I just write what I want the guitarist to play because I know what mm-hmm. I want to play. I don't need to bother. But um, at at one at the last one of the last rehearsals I did, I literally took the guitarist chart and wrote slash bass notes under on his chart where I had it, in, you know, in pen because I didn't do it in the typing. Uh, so I think going forward, I will start doing that. Yeah, I think they'll appreciate just knowing like what's the big picture of it. Um, 
So Deanna shares that she uses guitar tabs when she learns, and she's mainly a flute player. Oh, cool. Uh, doesn't the flute play in a completely different clef than like regular piano music? Or maybe I'm getting it confused with some other... I think uh, flute is one of the few that plays in, in C. Is that right, Deanna? I think flute is in C. Uh, clarinet is in D or something like that. Uh, I know just trumpets teeny, be flat. Teeny, teeny bit about reading sheet music, um, which came with piano lessons. But I read sheet music the way a two-year-old reads English, you know, very slowly. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe a four-year-old, a five-year-old. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, because I don't remember my two-year-old reading English. But, uh, um, so, okay, next question for you. Uh, do you have a spiritual philosophy that guides and informs what you do and how you live? I do. Uh, I am one of Jehovah's Witnesses, which means, of course, I'm a Christian. So I try to live my life by Bible principles. The simplest way to say that is just don't be a jerk. Um, <laughs> I mean, Jesus wasn't a jerk. We should try not to be jerk to people. Now, sometimes that's hard. Like I uh, discussed, I deal with depression and anxiety, and on the bad days, people do not want to be around me. I don't even want to be around me. And uh, especially we, we in the society we live in, there's a lot of stress and crazy things going on, such as global pandemics. And just also unsafe things. We, we talked about the shooting we had in Dayton before. Uh, it's not always safe to be out in public for people like me, especially in interactions with uh, law enforcement. Um, it is what it is. So there are a lot of things in life that could cause us to want to be a jerk to other people. <laughs> so mm -hmm. just really, I try hard not to be. To whoever mm -hmm. the other people might be, just be cool to people. Yeah, and, if wow. you and if you can't, try to remove yourself from that situation such that you are not uncool to people, right? Um, sometimes you're angry. Sometimes you're frustrated. Sometimes you're tired. Um, but you should, by you, I mean I. So speaking personally, I should try to fight that such that I'm not a jerk to someone else. I like that. Yeah, very well, very universal, <laughs> very simple, universally put. You know, there, I remember there were times for me, uh, I've been practicing Buddhism for about 12 years. And then before that, I was, I was born Catholic. I practiced as a Catholic. And then after college, maybe from college era on, there was a good chunk of years where I was just seeking. I didn't really, I had a sense, essentially, I believed in something greater and I have faith, but it was really a dark night of the soul for a couple of years. Um, and anyway, in the just even recent years, the past five years or so, I would just catch myself saying, just don't be an a-hole, John. Just, yeah. just don't be an asshole. And, and that's really all, all I have to do, you know, because then I can live with myself. You know, if I'm a decent guy, I can, I can go to bed at night. Uh, because sometimes I don't know where it would pop up, but maybe in some ways the perfectionist in me or this the overachiever in me. I have that streak, you know, growing up where I would be like... Uh, Yeah, it'd just be, if there's something I want to say, and it'd just be better if I don't say it, and it'd be fine if I don't it's, say it. You know? Honestly, sometimes that's hard, especially when there is something you want to say because you're motivated, and you might be motivated by good reasons, right? Mm -hmm. Justice or trying to help people. There's a whole lot of things that can motivate us to say something unkind, and we all do it. I'm not going to say that I haven't said something jerky to somebody before because we all have done that. Mm -hmm. just the, the struggle is try to just try to tell your try not to. <laughs> hard, I mean, it's hard to execute, but then that's where it boils right. down to, right? Try not to be a jerk. Uh, and yeah. Some days you fail and you are a jerk and try to, you know, if you if you are apologize to the people you were a jerk to and hope we can all move on. Yeah, yeah it happens, unfortunately. But yeah, no, that's it's a very human way of looking at it that we, we will slip and just move on and do our best to yeah, apologize, be accountable for our actions. and Which is forward. also hard, right? It's easy to say apologize, but, you know, pride gets in the way. And so, I mean, yeah. Um, and I feel like all of the world's religions have something 
in their moral code that say pretty much the same thing. It just takes them longer to say it, right? I mean, like the Bible's <laughs> like that. There's a lot of stuff in there. Um, but you could boil it down to don't be a jerk. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Uh, and Deanna says, uh, words of Bob Marley, don't worry, be happy. Yeah. Easier said than of, done. Yeah. Oh, that's for sure. Uh, but yeah, when you were in the present moment, um, it is uh, kind of our natural state is to just, we like, we, we rise to the, we float on the, on the water when we're in our natural state, you know, but when we're unnatural, we, we sink. And we live in an unnatural society, I would say, I would argue. Yep, so absolutely. It's very hard to be natural. Yeah, same core concepts. I agree, Deanna. My friends were just uh, sharing Bob Marley and a very diverse group of friends back and forth in this like text loop and a lot of respect for him. Uh, in, in the Buddhist circle, that, that uh, Buddhist organization in Brooklyn, because there's many you know, local organizations of this bigger one, uh, I was a leader for several years and I had the chance to help contribute writing music that we would sing and stuff. And um, one thing I did was I took the song Jamming by Bob Marley. We're jamming, you know that song? And I, I changed it to We're Chanting because we chant. That's our practice. We're chanting. I want to chant with you. And I just kind of, and there's a lot of like uh, Caribbean Americans in our, our group in, in this part of Brooklyn. And they just, everyone just got it, you know? And so it was just so easy to just sing this song with the Buddhist lyrics and everyone got into it. And, and Bob Molly just translated really well to these Buddhists, you know, um, especially with the words altered a little bit. And uh, Deanna says that she loves Joseph Campbell and that she's Hindu. So that that's- yeah. uh, So yeah. Deanna, I've been to India nine times for my corporate job. Wow. So, um, my nine team times. over there, yeah. <laughs> my team over there, um, majority Hindu, obviously. Uh, I, I feel like my team over there probably reflects the demographics of the country reasonably well. Um, Karnataka State is where I went. So Bangalore uh, or Bengaluru in the local language is where I went. Um, so I was never exposed to Hindus growing up in Ohio, of course. Um, more so now. Uh, uh, there's plenty of Indian restaurants around. The northern ones are run by um, Punjabis and Gujaratis, uh, usually. Um, but been around a lot of Hindus from being in India. I've been there for Diwali, which uh, was an interesting cultural experience for, from someone who had never seen it before. It's really mm -hmm. loud and boisterous for Diwali. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's colorful. It's colorful. Um, that's you know one of the things I like about travel is the chance to get exposed to other people's traditions, other people's cultures, and it's. Uh, so I'm not going to say his name, but one of my teammates there, uh, one day he was late. Uh, he was late for work, and uh, I didn't. You know, I didn't care because I want. I'm not the boss. I was just there to do training. But he wanted to explain to me why he was late for work, and his explanation was that. Um, well, he took a really long time to explain it. I, I think that he, this particular coworker, I had been a few times before we hired him, so he didn't know that I've been exposed to to their culture a little bit, and so he could have just said I had to do a puja. And I was late, and I would have been mm -hmm. cool, you know. But he he explained that uh, it was it, there was a specific significance of the day, and I don't remember what it was. But there was some food he had to put outside, and he wasn't allowed to leave the house until some birds took it. And the bird is the is the uh, incarnation of his ancestor or whatever. And so he explains it to me, and he's like, "You probably think that sounds silly," and I'm like, "I mean, there's a whole lot of things that Christians believe that you guys think sound silly. I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna <laughs> laugh at, mock, or judge your beliefs." It's cool, mm -hmm. right? Like he was like almost afraid to explain it in detail. And it's <laughs> like, I'm not going to make fun of you for what you believe. People could make fun of me for what I believe. And I wouldn't like that. So mm -hmm. like, again, don't be a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that basic principle came in really handy, right? And you yeah, travel throughout like, the world. I think it's cool. And I told him, yeah, so you had to do a puja. He's like, yeah, how'd you know that word? It's like, well, yeah, I've been here before. And I've mm -hmm. tried to do my research, you know, so some of, at least some of the customs, I like to know what's going on. It doesn't necessarily mean that I will participate in the customs, but I feel like when you should respect other people's faiths and not do anything to offend them if it's in your power. And yeah, it's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's awesome. I've been to India one time uh, for a good amount of time, three weeks, fortunately. And I did, uh, it was a study abroad. And I composed music with a whole bunch of film majors. So yeah, I loved it. And that, that was a stepping stone towards me 
both choosing Buddhism for my path, even though I didn't encounter that form there. It just helped me to be clear on what is right for me. And then also uh, become a humanitarian volunteer, which I did the following year. I, I went to India, Brazil, so I went to India uh, January, 2009. And then I was like on my humanitarian trip to Brazil, January, 2010. So like India just triggered a bunch of changes for me. It was really life-changing really. Um, and Deanna shares that uh, the story of how Ganesh got his elephant head is awesome, like a soap opera awesome. Oh yeah, that, that's really, some of those stories are really uh, lush Ganesh is and rich. Ganesh is my favorite. There's a poster of him in the office. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he's, he's, he stands out. Of all the Indian gods, uh, that's the one my son actually knows so far. Because, yeah, elephant guy. Uh, he's awesome. Um so are there any setbacks, Mike, that you'd feel comfortable to share and which music has helped you to pull through? Uh, yeah, so I'm dealing with anxiety and depression. And I actually, uh, last year, took a five and a half month uh, leave from my corporate job because dealing with my mental health, well, I was not very good at my job. It was making me ineffective at my job. Um, and... Like as a perfectionist and someone who doesn't like to not be good at things, especially things I should be good at, um, I'm sure I disappointed a lot of people in the company, but um, if any of them are ever watching this, I disappointed me first because I have very high standards for myself. And then I just, I mean, I just couldn't deal and I wasn't very good at the job, so I had to step away for a while. Um, that said, on the really bad days, I don't do music either. Like, uh, because, I mean, I do try to treat music like a business. I would like it to be my job someday. So that means that there are times I set aside for this is the time you have to write. This is the time you have to practice. And on a bad depression day, I don't do any of that either. Like, I'm not writing. I'm not practicing. I'm not doing any of the business admin stuff. Um, but on the days where I would be able to sit down and make some creative output, um, I'd be able to write things to get that stuff out. So, again, catharsis again, right? And I wrote... Mm -hmm a lot of songs during the pandemic um, from last you know last spring to now I've, I've probably got three albums worth of material like three albums worth of songs that i think are good enough i should i've written i wrote more that are not good enough but i have three albums worth of stuff that i think is good enough um you know the challenge is going to be finding the time and the financial wherewithal to get them recorded the way i want but no rush you know uh, mm -hmm. take my time to make a quality product but i would say that um being able to even if i wasn't making a song just sitting in front and on the piano and playing through chord progressions or coming up with melodies even if i wasn't gonna put structure to it uh, something about that just feels nice mm -hmm. and like when i'm having i'm glad live shows are back because when i'm having a bad day um we have a couple of um curated open mics here and even when i'm not playing just going out and watching people play guitar for a couple of hours you know their acoustic guitar or their piano and sing songs that they wrote just going out and watching other songwriters like makes me feel better it's weird like i get endorphins just from sitting and watching somebody play music um that said i mean I think depression is not something that goes away. Um, I've been, you know, doing my research and trying to learn about it. Uh, it's something that I'm managing, and I'm, I feel like I'm managing it better now than I did six months ago, but I'm still not managing it well. Uh, for instance, I did not work today. I spent most of the day today in bed. That's going to make my boss angry, and I let my team down. And by the way, knowing those things just compounds the, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's not like I don't want to do my job. Mm -hmm. I just was, today was an unproductive day. Um, I also did not do anything musical today. I didn't write anything. I didn't practice anything. Like, I literally didn't do anything uh, until, like, and then I took a long nap and then got up to get ready for this discussion. Um, that was my day today. Mm -hmm. um, now, talking about music with you, one, because you're very nice and cool, and two, because it's music, right? So having this discussion has helped me to feel better, and mm -hmm. maybe that'll carry over till tomorrow. 
maybe it won't. I don't know. I mean, it's too soon to tell. It's a, one of those things you got to take day by day. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that the little pieces of fleeting sanity that I have, um, music helps. It's not, by no means is it a cure. Um, and, and, it's, and it's kind of funny. People will be like, well, you have faith. You're a Christian. You know, God will fix you. And I'm like, so here's the way I look at that stuff. If I had lupus, faith is not going to fix that. You need to go get medical care for lupus. Mm -hmm. uh, or whatever insert malady of choice is. Mm -hmm. Depression and anxiety are health care issues. Faith might help me manage that. It's not going to cure it, and it's not treatment. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm taking, trying to follow the doctor's advice. I'm a little stubborn about some time, but I'm taking my medication, and like I'm doing the treatment stuff, and the faith and music are things that help make things feel better sometimes, but the root medical cause has to be addressed or I don't get better, right? So, mm -hmm. but yeah, music, like I've, I've been reasonably not jerky in our conversation, which means that it's been at least the last couple hours I've been feeling pretty okay. Um, <laughs> I am no fun to be around on the bad days, uh, which is why I don't leave the bed. Uh, well, one of the reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I've gone through enough of my own challenges to know that if, if someone's dealing with something that they're expressing is, is heavy to go through, I just have to believe them, you know, I, even if I've never been through that particular uh, feeling, perhaps, or state, um, you know, I, I have I'm type one diabetic now since 2014, and I'm on insulin, I have my pump. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I have a lot of faith, I practice, I chant every day. Um, I share Buddhism, uh, but if I don't take insulin, I will die you pretty die. soon. <laughs> yeah, pretty soon. So I have to manage that. And part of the benefit of having the, the practice, my Buddhist practice is a lot of mornings I wake up, I feel like crap is true. My back hurts. Uh, lately, my knee's been hurting for the past few years. And I am just have to just get out of the funk just to be functional within the first few hours of the day. It takes a while. But uh being able to chant and just to reflect and like, okay, you know, I have infinite potential as we all do. I respect all life, including my life, you know, and it's learning to put my own happiness first and then just realizing, okay, of all the things I can do, maybe there's some things I don't want to do, but what can I do today? And then I could find a few things that I want to do. And the more I do what my heart wants to do, then I get into that feeling glad to be alive more like okay all right it's not so bad and uh and then usually i find some a flow at some point in the day by pursuing that but there's always this uphill battle or this uphill climb like almost every morning for me i, I never I, I wouldn't say i'm, I'm have depression or anxiety as like a, a recurring thing but you know i live in this world and this world is can be pretty heavy and yep you know i have my own addictions whether it's to certain foods or uh, caffeine or whatever. Um, Deanna shared that she, uh, she has depression and anxiety too, and uh, cognitive behave behavioral therapy helps, she said, none for her. Yeah, it's really hard to find a therapist out here, Deanna. <laughs> Working mm -hmm. on it still. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did, uh, I did a ep uh, episode of the podcast with a woman named Diane Spindler, number 20 or something. Uh, a few back and she she's a therapist and she has some called um a, a, a gentle reprocessing gentle reprocessing and it's about trauma and how basically everybody has trauma and uh excuse me the more quickly we acknowledge it and because this trauma can be something small you know like seemingly small right like your teacher told you in kindergarten that you can't draw because you colored a, a tree purple and she said that was terrible and then I think you can't draw for the rest of your life and you know small things like that or even for me my father died when I was six it seems like okay yeah that's obviously a trauma but at some point someone you hear or you interpret the society saying okay get over it stop being a baby you brought that up for the first two or three years now you got to grow up so but you never really grow up from that in the terms of like you grow up too fast maybe I did but um 
it's it's going to hurt for the rest of your life. So, but I never really acknowledged it as a trauma, and you know, I always kept it as a distance because I didn't want to be a. I don't know about a baby, but I didn't want to, to milk it. I, I felt, you know, to keep on bringing it up. But there's so many things. If we just acknowledge and say, hey, this hurts. Uh, someone told me that I was, I sucked at art or something. And that it, it's wedged something that, that influenced my whole character. So if I don't acknowledge that, or if I do acknowledge it, I might be able to, to feel a lot better perhaps, or, you know, to free up other negative emotions that are coming from this, like a splinter, how bad is a, a splinter in your toe that you like hurts your whole body if you don't if you don't get it out? And once you get it out, like you feel a lot better, you know. Yep. The, the traumas can be like that, I believe. And anyway, I mentioned because that podcast was recently and it was uh, pretty uh, eye opening. I think talking about trauma these days seems to be more in the forefront or more or at least approachable. People can kind of get it nowadays. Why not help each other heal, you know? Yeah. Um, I think if people really pay attention to my lyrics, they'll probably figure that out about me. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, you're right what you know, mostly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yes, I, I didn't know you're Jehovah's Witness, and I didn't know you've traveled so much in, to India <laughs> nine times, you said. Uh, I've had some non-standard life experiences i guess you could say yeah mm -hmm. that's awesome so have you yeah mm -hmm. that's japan right and, japan and brazil that's not like an everyday dude experience no it's not and to learn those languages is definitely not common um but yeah actually when i did decide to learn the languages it was a lot of faith a lot of chanting but also like this decision like i'm gonna go beginner's mind be treated like a four or five year old make a lot of mistakes feel like a fool well, that's people laugh at me. It. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you learn two languages too. And, and honestly, I think that's the biggest obstacle for some people is they're afraid of looking like unintelligent or like a child. But when you first learn a new language, you are a child in that language. Lean into mm -hmm. that. Right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, man. And uh, yeah, I remember taking said to myself, okay, I'm not going to play guitar much while I'm here living in Japan. I'm not, of course, I'm not going to like avoid it, but I just, I didn't, my soul wasn't calling it, you know, I had to like find this new life. And so I'm going to take whatever energy I had for learning guitar and music so deeply and composing. And I'm going to put that all onto learning Japanese. And if I need to play music in between, I will, but, and I did that. I just took that intensity of focus on Japanese and I basically learned how to speak it enough to satisfy, you know, my goals. And uh, it's because it's, you know, music is a language, right? So, so learning. Have you written a song in Japanese yet? Hmm. Uh, no, I haven't. It's, uh, I probably, I've improvised a lot, you know, just. Are you motivated around. to? No, but I've played a lot of songs in Japanese. I did, uh, you know, a Facebook Live last year. The whole show was Japanese. Oh, cool. Um, I did a Facebook Live last year. The whole so show was uh Portuguese, so Brazilian songs. I might have put one or two Spanish ones because I didn't know enough Brazilian ones. Um, yeah, but yeah, I I like my, my biggest song on Spotify, ironically, is Batendo na Porta do Seu, which is uh, something about the door. Yeah, which is knocking on heaven's door in Brazilian. Oh. It, and it's a big hit there. And like the, they, some guys taught it to me there. And I'm like, I know the song, man. I've been playing it for years. And they're like, this is a big song in Brazil. And I'm like, it's, it's an American song. And they didn't believe me at first, you know. Uh, but anyway, I learned the lyrics. And then I recorded it here by myself in my basement, 2016 or something, released it. And it's my only song on Spotify that has over a thousand listens. Wow. So people in Brazil, I get, I look at the stats in different parts, states of Brazil, they listen to the song. Did Whatever. you write that? Dylan wrote that, right? Yeah, Dylan wrote it. And then um, this guy named Zé Hamalio, a uh, really legendary Brazilian artist, covered it and created his own lyrics to it, which is really just translation of the lyrics. I always, when I hear it, I always um, hear the Guns N' Roses cover in my head for some reason. Oh, me too. That's my, that's my go-to. Um, that's what I hear first. But uh, I, I don't know if I like that one the most anymore. I've listened to it recently and I just released it myself, the knock on heaven's door, not just a Brazilian one. 
it's pretty decent. I like it. My son likes my likes mine the best. I guess he heard more than anything else, and he said, "Yeah, that one." <laughs> um, so Deanna asked if he, she can friend you on Facebook. Yes. Yes. Thank you for asking. Yes, thank you, Diana, for checking in about that. And uh, oh, she has said she also has celiac disease, no gluten. Oh, that doesn't sound like any fun. No, I, I like bread and pasta very much. Yeah, me too. Yeah, so yeah, there's all sorts of stuff people are going through, and you never you never know uh, what someone's dealing with, what where, where they've been, where they're coming from. You know, what biases they may may have or may not have. You know. And uh, yeah, like it goes back to what we said, like if I don't be a jerk and then maybe the second thing I could do is actually listen to someone, yep. right? Then things might go real well, <laughs> you know? And, and learn even possibly, you know, when we listen. Yeah. And yeah, Deanna said that, that was a cool show. Uh, I don't know if she was talking about the one I mentioned, but I, I, if she's signing out, she's talking about our show, but she might still be with us. And now we've got a Brazilian friend tuning in, João de Jesus, who says, good evening, everyone. He's an arts coordinator in a town called Joho in cool. the state of Bahia, Brazil. Boa tarde. Boa tarde, João de Jesus. Um, so I have about two more questions for you, Mike, and our listeners. So can you share with us up to three inspiring books, films, shows, or more if you just can't help it, uh, albums that you would like to recommend to our listeners we're going to go so, albums because i'm a musician and it's easier than everything else sure uh one stevie wonders inner visions mm. uh, i'm gonna forget the year but early 70s um i'm gonna google the year because it bugs me that i forgot um that's what happens when you get old you know <laughs> 73 Sweet inner visions, cool. Yep. Stevie Wonder inner um, visions. Stevie Wonder played most of the instruments on the album by himself, and the guy can wow. see, which is like so beyond the songwriting and the arranging. He played most of the instruments by himself, and he cannot see. I have a hard enough time playing piano, and I see just fine. Like it's, <laughs> um, the songs. Uh, speak a lot to the African-American experience, the Black experience in America, because, again, you write what you know, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it is just kind of uncanny how fresh it sounds, even though it's almost 40 years old, um, mm -hmm. which really doesn't say much about our society that it still sounds relevant and fresh, especially some of the ones uh, where he's talking about painful things um, that some folks like us have to experience. If uh, even if you are not familiar with Stevie Wonder's music, there's a couple of songs on that record that were pretty big hits, and you've certainly heard uh, "Higher Ground" is one, and I believe the Red Hot Chili Peppers covered it in the '90s. Mm -hmm. um, everyone's heard that probably. And then there's a song "Don't You Worry About a Thing," which has a kind of Latin influence to it, and I'm that's been covered and sampled by people. So even if you are not familiar with Stevie Wonder, you at least heard two songs from that album. Um, Music history, from what I've read, tells us that it's one of the first cohesive albums in Black music, by which I mean, not just, I'm going to go into the music history nerd phase here, not just Black music, but all music at first was just like singles, and albums were just collections of singles, because it was cheaper, I guess, for the record company to put a bunch of singles on one piece of plastic. Um, but music was released for radio before, so that, like it was just one at a time. And in the rock genre, um, which is black music, but at the time had you know uh, became mostly white musicians making rock music, uh, cohesive albums as art statements, not just a collection of singles, became kind of started to become the norm. Um, and it's kind of weird how we're going, it's like music, everything comes full circle, right? Because now music is back to singles. Like kids don't listen to albums anymore, which we talk about, right? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, Stevie Wonder's Inner Visions was one of the first, if not the first um, black, because um, I don't think he got played on the pop of the rock stations. He got played on like the black or the R&B stations at the time. One of the first uh, records in that genre to be a cohesive artistic statement. Um, so it's kind of historic, but also the songs are good. And really that's the important thing. Um, 
serious. Like, I mean, there's not a lot of laughter on that record, but um, good songs. And when you listen to that music um, to Stevie Wonder, if you listen closely, you can hear how much he has influenced so many artists that came after him. Like Michael Jackson isn't Michael Jackson without Stevie Wonder. Um, Hip hop doesn't happen without Stevie Wonder. His use of synthesizers at that time of the 70s, um, like not a lot of people were doing it the way that he used synthesizers then. Um, probably because they were not, you know, they were new-ish. I guess they were starting to get smaller and portable uh, from the first models. Uh, very influential record, and I didn't even discover it until after my dad died and I heard his record collection. And I started uh. listening through my dad's records because I'm like, I can't have all these records and not listen to them, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then since I'm a complete nerd, when I listen to something that I don't know, I do the research and look up stuff about it. And, and when I listened to the Stevie, to Intervisions, I was like, and I, there are like three or four of those songs I heard before, not just the two that I mentioned, but I was like, oh, I've heard half of this record before. Mm -hmm. Didn't realize these songs were on this record. And then I didn't realize the significance of that record in music history. So that one, uh, in, inspiring and influential. Uh, number two, uh, Radiohead's OK Computer, which many days of the week, I will tell you, is my favorite album. I won't tell you that all the time because sometimes it changes. But I got albums been written about so much, I don't even know what I could possibly say about it that anyone hasn't said. It's, um, it's brilliant. And some of those songs, um, Let Down is a song that really resonates with me. Um, uh, that, that line, the lyric in there about being hysterical and useless, I feel like uh, that's a lyric I wish I'd written because I feel like that. I feel just like that a lot. Um, mm. But there's some interesting, musically, musically interesting things in that album that a band at that point in their career would have to be crazy to do and release. Mm -hmm. Especially considering that the, the album they released previously was a big pop hit. And um, I'm sure their label was asked, was wanting more of that. And they start this record with Airbag and Paranoid Android and released a goofy cartoon video for Paranoid Android. And they were going the complete opposite direction of trying to write pop hits. And it ends up being my favorite album in their catalog. Um, this is an artist that like decided to do what they wanted to do and it worked and people liked it. Um, yeah. I wonder what it would be like if people didn't like it and I had discovered it. What I still think is brilliant. I would like to think that I would still think it's brilliant because it's just mm -hmm. a great record. The songs are great. The production is interesting. And I always, every time I listen to it with headphones, I hear something I didn't hear before. And I'm always taking ideas um, from, oh, the way they double track the vocals here or the way they laid this synth track next to a guitar track. Um, there's, just, there's always something for me to learn about how to do an arrangement from those songs mm -hmm. and then, uh third uh chris cornell's first solo album uh euphoria morning mm -hmm. which um sadly uh he committed suicide of course uh, or died by suicide and um but this was well before that and it's i mean it's not obviously it's a <laughs> the album title is a total um uh, what's the word when two words are like the or uh, Forgetting the word, but like euphoria and then morning, M O U R N I N G, is like completely opposite ideas, right? Um, uh -huh. But the songs in that album are mostly sad. Mm -hmm. And I remember buying it like right when it came out. I loved all the songs. Uh, Cornell, I've always enjoyed his songwriting, um, but this is, was a complete departure from what he had done with Soundgarden, other than one or two ballads, but most of it was like loud, aggressive rock and roll, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, this is very singer songwritery, and he hired. Um, some really talented musicians. Uh, some of them got co-writing credits. Um, so either co-writers or through arrangements, but um, there's really interesting arrangements on the record. There's like oboe on it and piano and synth and like stuff that you wouldn't expect at the time from mm -hmm. like, this rock and roll star, right? But um, the songs are just so good and the lyrics are good. And uh, I actually saw him on the tour for that record in Paris. Um, the first time I had ever traveled out of the country on my own. Uh, I was 21 and I went to Paris. Um, I went to France for like three and a half weeks, but I spent like a week and a half in Paris. Um, and I found out that Cornell was going to be in Europe on his tour while I was over there. I was like, all right, I'm going. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, at the time, uh, so kids, you couldn't take your entire music collection with you when you traveled overseas in the past because we didn't have them on tiny little devices. I had a Sony Discman, which was a CD player that fit in my pocket um, because I had, I'm a big dude and I had big pockets. Um, mm -hmm. 
and I took five CDs. Like my listening for the entire three and a half week trip, if it wasn't on TV or the radio, was I had five CDs of my own music because you can only take so much music. Music. I remember that. In your mm-hmm. luggage, right? Um, and Chris Cornell's uh, Euphoria Morning album was one of those five CDs. And so since I only had five CDs, I listened to them in heavy rotation over and over and over and over and mm-hmm. over again. And it was just a memorable experience going to a concert in a completely different country. Um, I learned that the French people can all sing along the Fenelon Black Days in English because um, <laughs> we play that. <laughs> uh, yeah. they, they all knew the words of Fenelon Black Days, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, great show. His band was great. Um, since then, I believe one of them has passed away from cancer. One of the people in the band that, that, that played with them, Natasha, Natasha Snyder, I think her name was. Um, I, yeah, that's, that was just a fantastic show. Um, I remember I had a travel journal, so I wrote down the entire set list and actually wrote about this on my blog. So if you want to read about the show, like if you happen to be a Chris Cornell fan or just interested in more of the story, uh, let Google, uh, Google Chris Cornell concert and my name and then it'll find the blog on my website. There's a blog entry created about the show where I um, basically copied my travel journal into the blog so you can read what 21-year-old me was thinking. 21-year-old mm-hmm. 20, me, not very smart, but had good taste in music. <laughs> um, but nice. that record still means a lot to me to this day. Um, the song on it that I wish I'd written is called When I'm Down. Mm-hmm. It's just not a happy song, of course. But like the hook mm-hmm. lyric is, uh, like the chorus is, I only love you when I'm down, but the song ends with the lyric, and I'm down all the time. It's just a really good songwritery thing, but it's also right. one of those things that I could relate to personally. Um, yeah, great song. Wow, awesome, awesome recommendations. And uh, I have to just say a few words about them. Uh, Chris Cornell, Euphoria Morning. One of the more memorable things Chris Cornell did for me. Uh, I'm not a big fan of his, but he had a huge impact on my our generation, right, in the rock. So. I couldn't help. I had a few Soundgarden albums. Some of my friends were big Soundgarden fans, so I got a lot of him. Uh, and I thought Euphoria Morning, when it came out, especially, I was like, okay, this is good. This I like. I didn't like Soundgarden so much, even though I tried to. Um, and then uh, it, now, for me, Euphoria Morning is a little too dark to listen to, but uh, I it could see. It is dark. There's, I mean, he yeah. was not a happy individual. No. But the songs are great. Yeah, no, absolutely. And the sonic texture is really lovely. Great chords and stuff. That meant like the weird guitar chord sounds, like with that, like sort of a, what was that, uh, what was that effect called? Um, tremolo effect, I think, is on some of those chords. And then, uh, yeah, um, was the, uh, a Radiohead OK Computer. I'm not a big Radiohead fan, but that's definitely my favorite album of theirs. And it, it, you're right, it's just like this. Just what a special time for albums. Like, what was that, 95 or something? 97. 97 came out. Well, yeah. okay, somewhere in the mid 90s. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was Karma Police is on that one, right? Yep. Yeah, what, a, what an incredible sonic spectrum. The piano really makes that song. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's some songs in there that just make me think, like, all right, I like this. I don't particularly like Radiohead that much, but that album is really amazing for me. Uh, and then Stevie Wonder, not a big Stevie Wonder fan per se, but uh, I have a lot of respect for him and I'm totally open to, to whatever people want to tell me about him. And I'll definitely listen to that album. Uh, so there's a theme here of a Stevie Wonder. Well, first of all, I love Red Hot Chili Peppers. They're one of my favorite bands. So I love that song, High Ground. Uh, also, Last guest, my friend James Behan, a drummer from high school days, uh, recommended the song, uh, Stevie Wonder's song, As. He said it's like this was this really inspirational song you recently heard, As. I don't know if you know that song. I do not. Um, I don't know his discography the way I should. So, yeah, so his name came up last episode. And then I think it was in two episodes before that, I had a, a woman named Jennifer Hamady on, who's a vocal coach, uh, an extraordinary vocalist who um, had an, a, quite a colorful career touring with some big name musicians, uh, including Def Leppard. She sang back up for, I think she said, was it Donna Summer? I, I have to remember. So some pretty impressive names who she went on tour with and sang back up for. Cirque du Soleil, she was a part of that too. 
and she had the incredible opportunity to sing back up for Stevie Wonder. So his name came up a few times uh, recently on just on the show. So maybe it's a sign from the universe. And what a cool name, right? Stevie Wonder. Yeah, I wonder if that, I wonder, I wonder if that's his real name and I don't know, but I'm going to look it up right now. Yeah, I mean, I imagine it's not, but uh, it's... Land Hardaway Morris. All right, there you go. <laughs> hey, but Stevie Wonder is a really cool stage name, so good for him. And it's really what he, he was, right? He definitely felt like this is a wonder kid. Musical genius. I mean, just beyond the chops, which again, might I remind people, the man cannot see. Beyond mm-hmm. the ability to play multiple instruments, um, like being able to play the instrument and being able to compose and arrange are not the same skill set. No, that dude could do all of it. Yeah, plus not, lyrics, right? Yeah, not everybody can do all of it, but he mm-hmm. can. still can. Yeah. He's not dead. I mean, <laughs> right? Yeah, and, and he has this really unique voice, right? It's really high. Yep. Really clean, son- supersonic voice. And that's why I use Michael Jackson as a touchstone, right? Because there was a mm-hmm. point in time when Michael Jackson was the biggest pop star in the world. Mm-hmm. But like, I hear Michael Jackson, I listen to Stevie Wonder, and he, you know, obviously he did it first. I mean, mm-hmm. and music, there's always, right? There, there's nothing really super new anymore. Um, we are all the sum of our influences. You can make something unique, but there's always pieces that came from somewhere else. And I hear Stevie Wonder and a lot of the modern... Even a lot of mod, like Justin Timberlake music, the way that he mm-hmm. approaches a vocal. I hear a lot of Stevie Wonder in the way he does a vocal. Yeah, oh, I can see that. Yeah, so um, I just want to answer our, our question. Uh, Juan De Jesus asks about um, who is the guest today. I guess he's getting in here later, and I just want to reintroduce you. This is Mike, no Mike Bankhead. Um, uh, of Dayton, Ohio, a bassist, a lyricist, and vocalist, and singer-songwriter, piano player, and uh, yeah. yeah, he's hanging uh, out really. today. I'm uh, more of a composer on piano. I wouldn't call myself a piano player. That's mm-hmm. an insult to real piano players. <laughs> yeah, I, I know the feeling. I kind of feel similar about piano myself. Um, yeah, so uh, Mike, um, if you'd like to share, what are your plans in the upcoming several months? If there's anything like this to know? Uh, first, I'm going to play as many live shows as is safe to do. Um, a lot of uh, virus cases rising in my state. Uh, and I obviously would hate for someone to come to my show and get sick. But while we can still do shows, uh, as many of them as possible outdoors and distance, um, just because I wasn't able to play in front of people for so long. And it's a nice little endorphin kick to, mm-hmm. to do that. Um, also, it's good for working out new material. I write something new. It's nice to see how people react to it before I decide whether to take it to the studio. So I'm going to play as many shows as I can um, the next few months. I have only uh, two on the schedule so far, but I'm working on more writing, always writing, Uh, not just for um, things that might end up on one of my albums, but I have another project. I have a co-writer who's based out of Ipswich, England, uh, whose name is Ruth, who may or may not watch this someday. So Ruth, if you watch it, hello. Um, Ruth and I, our project is called We Met in Paris. And it works because it's true. Mm. Um, and so I, I do a lot of writing and sometimes I write a song and I think, yeah, this might be good for that project. But um, since it's a two person project, I can't decide it's good for that. Ruth has to sign off. Right. So uh, it's really interesting working with a co-writer uh, when you open up yourself to let them have edit access over your work. Um, the way we work is the original writer has final veto. But we I mean, we do let the other person edit our work and change words and change melodies and change chords. And um, so there are some things that are true 50, 50 collaborations between us. And some that are like 100% her, some that are 100% me, some that are like 90% her, but I made a 10% tweak, but um, I'm very excited about the quality of the songs we're writing um, and we're going to keep writing. And then eventually she's going to fly to the States and we're going to record it. But and the, we're still in, writing in creative mode and i want the bar for is this good enough to be really really high um which i think she struggles with sometimes because i can be a lot more critical of both of our work than she is Um, Mm -hmm. but 
I think there's serious potential in this project. Is it, it's going to end up being a different genre than when I usually write in. It'll probably lean more folk or indie folk or alt folk. And mm -hmm. uh, she's the better singer, so she's going to be the voice of the project. And I will just sing harmonies. But it's because I believe in the potential so much that I want to set the quality control bar so high. Like, I don't mm -hmm. want to settle for good. If we write a song and I say that's good, what can I do to make that great? Like, good is not good enough. Um, but I like where we're at so far. So writing for me, writing for that project, and I've been uh, talking to other musicians here in the Dayton area, and there's other people that I would love to co-write with, and I mentioned I'd love to co-write with you too. Um, I think especially if you write with people who are not from the same genre as you or come from a different musical background, um, you can discover you can a song can go a place that it wouldn't have been able to go with only one person's experience and mm -hmm. sometimes that doesn't work but when it does you could make really really great art and that's yeah. what it's about right so mm -hmm. i'm exploring more opportunities to do more co-writing um which requires someone i mean you got to be vulnerable when I mean, you got to let your else i mean you got to let go sometimes you mm -hmm. right? your co-writer's like that's uh, i want to get rid of that part you can't be like no i mean you mm -hmm. can but Right, you, you want you to should, flow. Yeah. yeah, you should never say no. You should say, let's try it and see what happens, right? <laughs> the answer is, let's try it and see what happens, see what it feels like. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then just yeah. trying to stay sane in this crazy, messed up society that we live in. Um, try to keep the really, the really dark feelings. Try to push those back. Mm -hmm. and bring some light to, uh, yeah, love. Yeah, self-love. I, I find self-love for me, it's like, it's really what I need. I guess I, sometimes I starve myself of love. And when I bring my love to myself, like in high doses, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, all right. Maybe I'm never going to get this love that I wish I can get from other people, but I can give it to myself. I could make that a priority. And then, then, I'm, not, then I'm easier than other people. I'm like, ah. I'm like, I, I, I know I'm loved and I'm going to share some of that love with you. <laughs> yeah, I struggle with that. And I don't know if, I mean, maybe that's the depression or maybe it's not, but it's uh, sometimes it's not a cool place to be. It's inside my own head. But, that's, you know, uh, it's one of the things that I try to deal with is try to tell myself that those really dark thoughts are not organic and they're a product of, you know, a, a health issue. Um, I'm just now noticing because your sleeve went up a little bit. You have a couple of lines of music staff on there. Well, what's that piece of music on your arm? Is what I want to know now. All right. So this is actually. Uh, I'm not going to flex because my guns are not that impressive. But this whole thing goes around. Uh, this is uh, "You Are My Sunshine." Oh, cool. And it starts over here. It's in the key of D. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy. The whole thing. And I double checked. All the notes are correct. Um, I thought about it a long time and uh, I designed it, the tattoo artist worked with me and my grandfather figure, not my blood grandfather, but figure, uh, he sang it to me on his deathbed and he never sang. My mother sang it to me as a kid. My grandmother sang it to me as a kid. It's one of these songs I learned, you know, and, and play perform many times. I do it my own way. So I just thought, yeah, and that's actually not a happy song. Um, it sounds happy, but the verses are very depressing. But um, anyway, that's what Have that is. Have you written a song about that experience, about the deathbed sitting experience? No, but that could be some fun lyrics to put together or I touching. Mean, it, I mean, it probably would be difficult emotionally to write, but I feel like that's a unique experience. There's probably not a lot of people that have had someone sing to them on their deathbed, right? Um, Mm -hmm. And I feel like unique experiences like that, but unique experiences that are actually lived, make for good song fodder. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I do believe in, I heard it somewhere, but I definitely believe that uh, the more personal your writing is, whether it's a book or, or a song, the more universal it is. So if it's truly personal, then it's truly universal. Um, even if it's not about you, which, mm -hmm. and then some people might be like, well, how do you even do that? Well, <laughs> the same way fiction writers do, right? You have to think of a character and you have to live with them in your head for a bit, mm -hmm. really delve into their motivations and their experiences 
Um, that's the part, that's something I would like to get better at. I mean, I've started doing that. Not all of my songs are about me. Like, I would like to reassure people that my creepy song about the stalker who stalks the actress that he sees on TV is not uh, something that I have done or would do. <laughs> right? So not all the songs I write are about me. Um, but I think that is a, as a skill set that as a songwriter, I would like to sharpen. Mm -hmm. Right, be able to write a song that is not about me or from my experience at all, but and as a person who always wanted to be an author but never figured out how to plot, <laughs> like mm -hmm. which is kind of important to write fiction, you need to be able to figure out how to write a plot. Um, I would like to take those authoring aspirations and find a person or a situation, live in that space, and use that for songwriting. Now, see, I won't use your experience because that's not fair. <laughs> but if uh, if I didn't know you and I like just heard a podcast and someone had that experience, I might do something like write a song based on that experience. But I would ask myself, I would have to fill in other details of the situation if I only know mm -hmm. the detail. But you have an advantage. This is your life and your experience. You know everything about the situation. And <laughs> if you could get over the emotional hurdle, because it probably would hurt to write about. I think that would probably make a fantastic piece of art. Yeah, I, I never thought about it. Um, but there, there are some family things I could bring to light, whether it's, rap, whether it's all about him or, or about how that song ties a few important people to my life, you know? And that's the beauty of songwriting. If it's too close to home, you can change enough details to make it a little farther. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's subtle things you can tweak when you've lived it to make it just different enough. Um, yeah. Yeah. The one song that besides Batendo na Porto do Seo that, that's doing what did wrong in Brazil, apparently, uh, that I wrote the original, uh, an original, that's not original, but it's just that song Daddy I mentioned earlier that I wrote for my father that I played in Texas that time. I'm going to link to the video in the show notes. That just poured out of me at the age of 17. It was one of the first acoustic songs I wrote. Everything before that was metal. And uh, it was like, just flew, flowed, flowed right out of me, all the words. I cried a few times as I wrote it. Like, I just couldn't play through the song. I would always cry in the middle and just stop. And I knew that I, I must have something. So I wasn't afraid to write it. I didn't want to, again, I didn't want to abuse it like, wait, this is my, this is a real emotion. Like, am I abusing it by playing it over and over again to people? But people would cry, people would emote, people would be happy, they would request it. So I figured, I guess, uh, I guess it's a real, it's a real, it's a statement that captures something special. And isn't that what you want as a songwriter? Like the worst reaction you could ever get playing a song in front of people is, eh. Yeah, right. But like, if you're <laughs> moving people to tears, uh, you've got something in a song. I mean, that's... Yeah, it's kind of what we are dream of in a way, in some yeah. level. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we have a few more questions, but I do want to uh, wrap up. We respect your time and, and respect uh, my body. I'm getting a little tired. Um, so if uh, where can people find you, Mike, and learn more about what you have to offer? I would love to send people to mikebankheadmusic.com. That's my website. Mm -hmm. If I had one request of the website visitors, there's an email list sign up on that first splash page. Please join my mailing list. You will not get spammed. I write all of the emails to my mailing list myself, but it's my way to let people know what I have going on musically. If I have a new release, if I'm playing shows, if I'm thinking about something and I want to communicate that, uh, if you missed the earlier part of our discussion, when you're an independent musician, it is very important for us as musicians to form a personal connection to our listeners. Like, we want to have a relationship with our listeners, not the kind where we live together, but like a personal connection, which is why I'm hoping you can see not just my personality, but also John's and, and this podcast. And signing up to our email list is a way that lets us communicate to you in a way that is not really possible on social media, mm -hmm. especially because social media sites, useful though they are, tend to throttle down posts from our business pages because they would like us to pay money for advertising, which I get. 
they're a business. They got to make money. Yeah. Um, but independent musicians, we're businesses too. We're our own CEOs and our own quality control department and our own writing department, our own editing department, our own, you know, we do it all. Um, and so I would really like it if you visit my website to sign up for my mailing list and then let me communicate with you. It's not all the time, but often enough that I would like for you not to forget me. Mm -hmm. If you're curious about my music, it is all available on my website for free on the music page. If you like to stream music, all of the songs are also available on all your streaming services, except there are five of them on a split album I released in 2019 uh, called Defacing the Moon. Those five are not on any streaming services, but they are on my website. And if perchance you have disposable income, I do have CDs and T-shirts on the website. And if you don't have a CD player, you can also buy high quality download on the website if uh, that is your preference. Um, no, what, what, what do they say on uh, in the little, like, like uh, no purchase necessary. So no purchase necessary, but if you feel like it, uh, I'm not going to tell you not to click on the store button on my website. <laughs> Very well said, Mike. Uh, you, you really let, laid it out in a way that people, I think, would generally understand the heart of, you know, that you want to connect with them, that it's important that we feel supported as, as singer songwriters and DOA artists. We put a lot of ourselves into this. Uh, people who don't do this may not realize it. So thank you for pointing that out. And that, uh, yeah, my, my mailing list too. I'm always happy to have people join. Um, I could speak, uh, I could vouch for Mike Bankhead when he says that he doesn't spam me with his mailing list. He doesn't. I'm always happy to receive his emails. Uh, I open them and I I don't regret it. it he's very personal and he uh, doesn't, not too long-winded at all. It usually gets to the point and usually has something nice to, to share. And he asks for our opinions. And he, you know, he says, I wonder what you get, what you think. And so, and I've responded to Mike a few times and he responds back. You have, you're actually been very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, and then your, your um, mailing list is inspiring to me because it shows me that Hey, here's a guy who just does it the way he does it. Very non-obtrusive, but but regular, you know. So I I won't. It's not easy for me to forget you, like you said. But at the same time, I, don't, I never feel like uh, overwhelmed or anything like that. So yeah, well done. Thank you. Yes, please please go sign uh, Mike Bankhead's mailing list at mike mikebankheadmusic.com. And um, so Mike, it's been a true pleasure. It's yeah, been a lot fun. of fun. Yeah, man. Thanks for hanging out with me for so long. And, uh, you know, uh, when, it's, when it's enjoyable, you almost don't even notice the time going by. And I look at the clock and it's almost 11. And I'm like, did we really talk for almost three hours? It's like, we I guess really so. Because <laughs> we, we didn't start late. So no. I guess so. That was yeah. awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, I guess I'll see you at the CD Baby conference in a, in a live room, maybe at some point. I really hope they come back uh, when it's safe to do so. And uh, yeah, we can hang out again and talk music in person. That'd be wonderful. Yeah. And, uh, but we'll be, we'll be in touch and I'll send you these links to the YouTube and the Facebook afterwards an email and feel free to share it if you'd Thank like. You. Actually, I have, uh, <laughs> I'm going to fly the flag for my city here. Uh, you mentioned you're unfamiliar with guided by voices. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to make a personal Guided by Voices playlist for you on Spotify. Um, and I would, I would like you to realize how difficult this is because they literally have dozens of albums. And of the ones that they have released, I only own like eight to ten. I got more than that. But I mean, I have maybe one dozen of their albums on CD, but they have several more dozen released than the ones that I have bought. And it is they've put out so much stuff it's hard to keep track of but i'm going to go through my favorite songs from their catalog and and put something together for you as an introduction uh to the most prolific songwriter from our city um cool. who among indie rock circles he's kind of legendary among indie rock circles if you are in that particular genre but when you hear these songs I have a feeling you're going to hear some of the influence in the stuff that I do. Um, yeah. Those mm -hmm. guys cast a long shadow over our town. And if you're doing that kind of music in this town, it's really hard to not homage them sometimes. <laughs> musically. Cool. Yeah. Good. I'm, I'm, I appreciate it. I'm open to listen to some new stuff and especially prolific writer and, and something that comes highly recommended. 
So, all right. Thanks, Mike, so much. Have a fantastic night. And, uh, and we'll be in touch, my friend. Yes, sir. Night, John. Be well. Have a good night. Good night, everybody.